To the link with Chris and Sabrina on Breeze 93.9. Back in Tunguinigita, no who have me done no family. Mandagdanya ha po po na tiempo Sa yesti gusto bring familia Si ta no ho gai kiki kusina Si ta to gito I dos celu ho mi fion sa ilahu Sa mani si si ta atudu Ay na mina Magoof na isin yung teku Saman ka balis ham todo Gagagaw hao tu usay na Tsakaw ta mas malago Anahi mo na ikarera niya Ni todo siya giling na loo Ay na minagoof na temo
the link. The link. Join the conversation now with Chris and Sabrina. Call 637-0094. Breeze 93.9 FM. Tula 
nuci Nai pendera Kaigi Pues Aten fani Bandera Kau Esta pokwa Puma la La pa Gilo Tanu Manli Bri Ten Tanu Ti
Jason. Good morning. Right on. Uh, Joe, sir, with the beautiful scenic Harmon sunrise cam out there. Beautiful scenic Harmon. Yeah, we, we love we love uh, power lines here. Up yeah, north. we do. Yeah, we sure do. Hey, Christy Sinicholas, good morning from Ohio State. Wow. Does that mean the great state of Ohio or in Columbus, the Ohio State University? Good morning. Good morning, good morning Christy. Good morning, morning, Facebook Live, 621, Thursday, June 24th. Welcome to the link. My name is Chris. That's Jason. Sabrina Sauce, Matt Tanani on leave. Uh, so you've got us. Uh, here's who's coming up on the show this morning. Well, a big show. Uh, we're going to be jumping on live from the uh, Guam Hotel Restaurant Association uh, Economic Forum. Uh, Jay? Yeah, so um, as we were telling you yesterday, GHRA President Mary Torres uh, is going to, and she and a panel of experts, including economists, uh, GovGuam leaders, uh, business people that work in the hospitality industry, as well as some of the other very critical uh, markets here on Guam, they are going to break down exactly what the Air VNV uh, program. You know, we touched on it yesterday. Now that the standard operating procedure has been uh, properly codified, it's now it's now a living document. Uh, the governor is also going to give her opening remarks, and we've been hearing, although you know Adeloup hasn't budged on this, we've been trying to needle them on this. But they said the governor is expected to make 
a substantial announcement today. That's what that's what we're hearing. Yeah, I, so I don't know. Fortunately, she's speaking like right off the top. I know yeah. the uh, the keynote address is supposed to be given by our friend uh, Dr. John Rivera of the University of Guam. He runs the uh, Center for Public Policy up there mm-hmm. over at UOG, and then the governor is supposed to come on right afterwards. And I don't know. You you can conjecture, you can speculate, whatever like that about what she might announce. Um, but she is supposed to make, we, we've been hearing some sort of a uh, very significant announcement today. So that's going to be around 830-ish. Right. And we're going to be jumping on that live stream uh, here on the link. Also coming up this morning, Chief of Police, Stephen Ignacio. Uh, we'll catch up with Catherine Castro of the Guam Chamber and get their uh, two cents on this economic forum, uh, what they're looking forward to uh, seeing uh, discussion on and what they're thinking about discussing. And then we've got a great uh, segment here in full Zoom with Nestor Lecanto. He's chatting with the Gita administrator, uh, Melanie Mendiola. Good stuff. Yeah, so that, that uh, we actually shot that and it premiered last night. Uh, by the way, uh, Melanie actually said something which, which we did not know because, you know, it's been a while since we've had Mel on our show. Uh, she is expecting her first child. And ver- um, she actually said, you know, she, she'd allowed us to say this, uh, her due date. For her very first baby is Liberation Day. Ah, oh, yeah. oh, how cool is that? That's yeah. marketing right there. But she she still <laughs> continues to, you know, she trudges on. She's she's continuing to work, and she really broke down this uh, small business pandemic assistance grant uh, to Nestor, showing right. them how, you know, now that we're in what can be considered recovery mode, you know, what Gita, uh, what plans they have, how you can qualify if you are a small business, and uh, how they can help you get back on your feet and contribute to the island economy. That's good stuff, man. Yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to that. And then we've got Profiles in Pride. We've been doing this for uh, Pride Month. And we're going to be profiling Glenn Lujan and Josh St. Augustine, uh, the hosts of the Hoffa Days uh, podcast. It's a new podcast that we're uh, unveiling on the KUAM Podcast Network. And we're going to get that. Uh, we're shooting to get that out. We've got two podcasts potentially coming out like next week. Right. Both are really stuff you're going to want to download yeah. and then listen to and then really just like let sink in because you, you've seen glenn on the comments for you know like the last year yeah. and a half yeah. here on the show he's a member of the link fam as you all are um he always greets each and every one of you yeah. you know ask glenn's you guys how great you're doing. good guy yeah and now you're actually going to get an inside look at what he and josh you know as members of the lgbtq community uh you know what work they do on the island they also very candidly share the stories of how they came out right uh, glenn's story is actually quite funny yeah about how how he came out to his mom. Yeah, it's it's you guys are gonna love this segment. And what's cool about this uh, podcast, Havadezo, that we're gonna uh, be debuting on the KUAM Podcast Network, is it's kind of like uh, intergenerational, where you have Glenn Lujan, who's like an old school gay. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, Sisters of the Moonlight. Yep. That kind of deal. And then you've got Josh and Augustine, who's a younger kid. Mm-hmm. And so you've got these two different perspectives on you know living uh in lgbtqia um mm. the lgbtqia plus i believe is like yeah the, right yeah. um if you want to get if you want to get technical <laughs> with it but i mean i mean it is you know it's it's very honest it's really you know what we're revealing. saying though <laughs> yeah and, it, and if you've interacted with glenn here in comments here on facebook live for even two minutes cool guy yeah, yeah you know he's super upbeat he's got a crazy sense of humor yeah you know, remember we and we we actually had, and he's got nothing to hide we had brought him and the archbishop together on this show that was wild that was pretty pretty great uh pretty cool dialogue uh i don't know if it ever really went anywhere after that but uh glenn is a great supporter of the link and you guys are gonna i'm just telling you you're gonna love this off of Days of podcast i mean they're they're funny right they're very uh open <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he's also he's also very encouraging and inspiring and you know i mean he is yes. an educator too yeah, and, totally. and by that merit there's just know, so many different great things about it you're gonna love it yeah and he, go, he goes you know i'm using my training and my background uh to teach others you know and he goes you know just in the same way that in the states you know carl nasib is now the first uh active nfl player to have come out and and revealed his truth that the he defensive is end right Defen- defensive end for the raiders right it, yeah. Big dude. I mean, a Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year when he played at Penn State with Saquon Bartley. I remember that. Um, but Glenn has also said, you know, I'm not only a a teacher, you know, of, of our culture. He goes, he's also a student of history, so he's also learning from the new, next generation like Josh. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then we're also, we've also got a really, really good guest. Speaking of going live, we've we've got a fantastic gentleman, a member of our community that is, you know, Who's, oh, great. whose morals and punctuality are impeccable. Oh, here we go. 
At yeah. nine at nine o'clock, yeah, we will be going live with, with our own Chris Barnett. You're heading out in the field in the middle of the show today. I'm going out in the field, guys. What are you up to? Uh, so there's summer school going on at Atacal Elementary, and uh, I was Over invited. In yeah, I was invited to go read a book. Nice. Uh, which I do all the time, but I haven't done since the pandemic. Obviously. So you're gonna read the kids. Yeah. So I've done, man. Those are so much fun. Yeah. Well, did you have your choice of what book you're going to read? Uh, they said they had a book for me, but I was actually, because it's fourth grade, I was uh, looking through all the books at the house, and I got this one book that I really like, the kids like. Uh, so I'm probably going to read that one, and then we'll see what they have. What, what book is it? Uh, it's called Zen Shorts. Zen Shorts? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll bring it in. Someday. You're going to get, like, all feng shui with, like, the nah, little it's ones? Cool. It's cool. It's I don't know how to explain it, but it's a cool story. It's a cool okay. story, bro. Last, last time I actually read to kids, I went up to, um, I want to say I went up to F.B. Leon Girl once, and I went over to St. John's, but I, I always try and read The Lorax by Dr. Seuss. Right. Dr. Seuss is always a good, yeah. good pick. And, Dr., you know, Dr. Seuss, because you, you learn such valuable, like, like, life lessons, or you can have your mind blown beneath the guise of, like, absolute gibberish. I mean, it, it sounds like it's, you know, just nonsense and everything, but it's like, wow, what, you know, what, once the moral hits... It's like, dude, this guy's serious. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, it's 628. We can't destroy the planet if we keep screwing around. Uh, good morning. The show is brought to you by Pacific Points, IT&E, Cabo Enterprises, and Jack in the Box. That's what's coming up on the show. Good morning, Facebook Live. Let's see what we got here, guys. Ron, uh, Ron Castro, first one in. Buenas, sunshine emoji. Uh, George A. Cruz, Jr. Hoffman in. Good morning, KUAM Link team. Rosemary Laguatnia, good morning, team. Good morning to you, Rosemary. Good morning, everybody. Yes. Oh, Joe Sir's going to like this. I, I just saw, like, uh, while well, we I pull up our shout-outs, so I can say hi to everybody, too. Uh, Joe, coming starting July 1st on Netflix is the entire Twilight series. You're going to like that. All right, yeah, Joe's a big <laughs> Edward Cullen. You like the sparkly vampires, right? Are you, are you team Edward or team Jacob, Joe Sir? Team Jacob. <laughs> team Jacob, Team Jacob. Course, yeah. He's indigenous. Huh? Okay. Oh, we, we have a birthday <laughs> shout out. Right. Uh, Joseph Mat- Joseph Matanonia saying, Chris, can you please wish Mona Lisa San Augustine be a oh, day? Mona Lisa. <laughs> Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa, mi amor. Happy birthday, Mona Lisa. Uh, what else we got here? Ruth, Pablo Gagnon, Havane Guam, USA, John Bucat, beautiful in Alahan, checking in. Linda Buena, good morning, Guam. Emma Ololia, good morning. Roberto Fracassini. Uh, Debbie Davis, Mama Bear over in Bardstown, Kentucky, says, I love my sweet friend F. Glenn Lujan. And then she uses the entire spectrum, all all colors of the heart emojis. Good day. Uh, JJ Microcap, good morning. Linda Yatar, good morning, Linda. Manana Sidus, Gitano, amen. And, and, and you know, I, there was a birthday shout out that I read uh, the other night on the news. It was for um, uh, a member of the Yatar family. I okay. believe it was the um, one of the parents. I believe it was, was the dad. And, Okay, cool. Yeah. Happy birthday. Yeah, you know Tony Atar, right? Yeah. Yeah, the baseball player in GCC. Yes, sir. Yeah. Good Vin, uh, Vince Bunchu Rages, Hoffaday from Pennsylvania. Wow. Manny Santos, Buenos and Hoffaday, and good morning. IT&E Techs on. Thank you. Hey. Christy St. Nicholas, like Jay said, from Ohio State. Josie Akpaji, Hoffaday, beautiful people of Paradise Island of Guam. They are dotting the I. O. H. I. O. You know, I, I'm a I'm a Michigan fan, but I gotta admit when when, <laughs> when the greatest damn marching band in the land, and that's how they prefer to be called, when they take the field, that's a sight to see, man. Uh, we also got here Mike Grace Blas watching from Lower JFK. Where's that, Jay? Would that be like down the hill, like right? Maybe like the... halfway down, right? So basically, stay down. Don't go up that hill. <laughs> Actually, that one's not as bad as the next one over. What's the the really? At the oh, end? Happy Landing Road. The one at the end of 2-1. You go up to Bayview, past Delmonico. Oh, the, um, ah. I yeah, that one. Was... JFK, man, you know, because. Uh, and you've run that a couple I've times, used right? to I used to do half marathons, you know. J- JFK Hill is I don't do them anymore, obviously. But, yeah, JFK Hill, it kind of sticks in your mind like, oh, my God, i got to run up JFK Hill. But before you know it, it's over. No, I've tried, I've tried yeah, I've tried biking up Happy Landing yeah. Road and then jogging up Happy Landing Road. That is, I mean, you think you're going to see St. Peter when you get to, like, the, the top of, yeah. you know. It sucks. When you come out. It's yep. it's very, very steep. Yep. I'm so glad my little thing into running is over. Because, you know, they're always like, oh, you get a runner's high. You, you don't. I never had it once. And if you look at people out here who are running, they all look miserable. 
Like you never see anyone running and they're like smiling. You know, they all look like, oh, you, you die. <laughs> but you know, each and every one of them is in the right? same shape. Like, oh, you, uh. I know the runners are hating on me now, but they they know it. They hate, runners hate running because I was with her, I was with the Gorilla Run team for a minute. Uh, and let me tell you that nobody likes it. They hate it. Oh, well, what was it, what was your course? What did you guys when you guys trained? Where did you normally go? We would start at like Custom Fitness all the way up to. I mean, man, we would go all the way to GBB and back. It's nuts. It's crazy. So That's why God invented cars. Basically, down in Inigua, all the way yeah, yeah, heading yeah. north back up. Yep. Back up to Epal Beach. My advice: don't do it. Yeah. Uh, Julie. Meanwhile, okay. I don't Joseph, know. Joseph uh, Quintanita says, "Try the hills down south." Yeah. No, thank you. Well, Fra you know, Frank the Crank Camacho did that. Remember yeah, uh, at the beginning yeah. of the year, he did that for, for charity, right? <laughs> and Frank went from what? He started uh, at uh, Marizzo Pier. Right. And then he was planning to Along go all and, and Guam time. They did a whole all around the island. Yeah. That's that's a circuit right there. Uh, Chris Bendelion Guerrero, Havane from St. Ben. Right on. Oh, speaking of which, do you know how, uh, how Frank, Frank the Crank's doing? Because remember, we had him on a couple weeks ago after he had that, that very yeah. scary auto accident he he was fine after that minor injuries they said he had some like herniated disc in his neck have, have you found out how uh primo yeah, he's doing? doing good he's do okay yeah good uh 633 let's go ahead and get into the news now there's definitely a lot to talk about this morning but because we got this economic forum and a guest and i'm gonna go take off reading uh there was that big hearing last night with uh, bill 112 uh and so we'll line up a bunch of the actors in that uh hearing um for tomorrow Okay, uh, it was good. We're just kind of watching it. It was a three-hour hearing, uh, and then uh, right before the hearing, the vice speaker, uh, Tina Mooney Barnes, had uh, announced to the world uh, that she was withdrawing her co-sponsorship of Bill 112, and um, she had attached uh, in her letter to the speaker uh, 33 pages of autographs of people, various uh, people, um, from uh, obviously a bunch of doctors who oppose this Bill 112. Um, I think there were also uh, non-doctors. I think I saw a senator's wife sign it. Uh, yeah, so it was like 33 pages of people were saying, we don't, we hate Bill 112. Um, and that was just minutes before the hearing. And so the hearing is, uh, it was an informational hearing where they had a couple of attorneys and then some folks from the insurance uh, industry uh, just kind of really going into the weeds, like they say on the current uh, medical mal malpractice arbitration uh, law and what 112 uh, would change if uh, passed into law. But it's just so interesting to me, guys, and the debate on this hasn't even really started yet. And again, this is the first of three. The yeah. next two, one's going to well, be on next, July, there's July 7th and July 12th. Yeah, there's, so there's public hearings, which anybody can go and testify, and then this informational hearing was kind of more like they've got these two lawyers. They had Mitch Thompson, who... Uh, I believe represents SDA, but then he had said he's there in his personal capacity. And then he had attorney uh, Keo, who had provided probably the most favorable testimony uh, in support of Bill 112 uh, during this uh, hearing last night. And they kind of did a little, there's a little bit of a back and forth there. Um, and so it's really interesting to me that we're seeing these uh, doctors um, come out and basically say like hey we're not going to treat anybody we're not going to treat anybody because this bill is going to uh, set guam back what is it 20 30 years is what the doctors are uh, saying it's going to do but i just think it's so interesting that they're already at i mean it was zero to 100 before this thing was even introduced it haven't even it has not even been debated and already doctors are saying we're not going to do this we're not going to do that and so you can see this little, uh, it's going to be a battle. I mean, the doctors, to me, with this 33 pages of signatures and how they're just coming out so hard saying that just because we're thinking about this bill and it's being introduced, they're now going to be pulling back on all kinds of services. Um, it's really a flex, guys. I mean, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. They obviously believe that this bill is going to put them out of business and, you know, uh, make it, even more difficult to attract specialists that specialists that we don't already attract. And I think <laughs> we, the issue seems to be, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but the issue seems to be what the standard of care is on Guam, if even there is one, right? Well, yeah. There depending, so on, depending on what your perspective right, is, you right, can right. say what the standard of care is or we have no standard of care. Well, so Speaker Tulay, she came on yesterday. I mean, she was on for a long time, really, because, I, you know, there's a lot of questions about this bill, and I think part of the reason why people have a lot of questions is they don't know. 
And so she really was kind of sharing what this Bill 112 um, would uh, do. And I think one of the main issues, and there are a, a, it sounds like there's a bunch of issues if you listen to this hearing, but one of the main issues that everyone keeps talking about is, oh, it's just so impossible for the average person to bring a claim against a doctor for medical malpractice because you need all this crazy money up front. Uh, there's a whole process where you go b before this uh, panel. And, um, and then if you lose and you want a jury trial and you lose the jury trial you have to pay the uh doctor's attorney's fees and like pretty much everything so it's just a crazy process guys um and that was uh, addressed so i'm not sure you know it's interesting to me because uh with these doctors and i mean we know all the doctors and it's also very very interesting to me that we're talking about this measure coming off of this pandemic and during the pandemic, doctor's status, nurse's status, pretty much all frontliners, so to speak, they've been elevated so high. I mean, everyone's just like, we love the doctors. And so uh, I know that some of the doctors, they feel attacked, right? They feel triggered by this uh, measure. But I think we take it out of context and let's, you know, pretend we didn't just come out of a pandemic, which obviously is a stretch for a lot of people to do. Um, where does this put us in comparison with other jurisdictions as in, in terms of how accessible the right to file a claim against a doctor for medical malpractice, uh, how accessible that process is for everybody? Because right now it seems pretty impossible. I mean, if you look at the number of, co of complaints that have been lodged over the years, the number of complaints that have successfully moved beyond the arbitration process, it's like a handful, less than 10 or something. Uh, so obviously something needs to be done to bring the cost of, uh, you know, filing a medical malpractice claim back down to earth. Because it's almost like <laughs> there's this uh, assumption that the people who are flying the, filing the claims make as much as the doctors, which they don't. I mean, most times we're talking about four people. And it was really interesting to read Attorney Keogh's testimony, specifically when he talked about his history as a lawyer and how many cases um, he's taken on for, you know, medical malpractice. What's more interesting is how many cases he hasn't uh, taken on, which is a whole lot. Uh, and so we're going to really try and just do the time, really kind of talk about this today. But uh, I was thinking tomorrow we just really flesh it out. We'll get some clips from the hearing, uh, which again was at 5 p.m. yesterday. So I know a lot of people didn't get to watch it. Uh, but it's just, to me, really, really... It's going to be a show, guys. I mean, honest, it's going to be a show. This bill has the support. Has. It had the support. And to me, when you get the vice speaker announcing her withdrawal of uh, her co-sponsorship, then that means that we're going to see the any senators like Senator Shelton, probably Senator Rogel also. I don't know. I'm wondering if they're going to follow suit. And, who, yeah, who, who else co-sponsored her? So, so now if vice speaker well, it's a speaker, it out. A speaker and uh, Senator Tello. Or I believe the main two were the primary sponsors. Right, yeah. Okay. And so it had the votes. I mean, they had twelve senators who said, "Yeah, we're we're going to do this." Uh, so now you're going to see these doctors, and they had to come. When when you see like if you're a doctor, or you're someone who opposes this measure, and you see like, oh god, they got twelve votes, then you have to really come out hard, and that's what the doctors did. I mean, they came out hard. It started with Shea saying, "I'm not going to do this because of this bill that's not even introduced yet." And then you had the pediatricians come out yesterday or the day, a couple days ago. On, on paper. Yeah, that, that was my question. Were any physicians present at last night? No, show? because this was an informational hearing yeah. where they already set who was going to come in and give the information. Okay. So the public hearing, um, there's two more on hearings on no, this. But we did that, hear from attorneys last night. Yeah, and so yeah. because they had kind of like, a, well, they did like a kind of a pro-con mm -hmm. okay. uh, thing. Yeah, so you, you've had the pediatricians come out and then you had vice speaker come out with, again, 30 pages of uh, signatures. So it almost seems like the opposition to this bill, they put, like, all the chips in the middle of the table. So early in the game, too. I mean, I think it's... We can't talk about this, or we can't debate it, you know what I mean? Let the process play out. Um, because that is the process of uh, legislation. You have hearings on it. You get the information. You have public hearings. You let the public decide. And so what, I, what I'm seeing here, and it is what it is again, guys, whatever side of this thing you're on, um, what I'm seeing now is they're really trying to just kill this measure outright and not let it see any debate on the legislative uh, floor. I mean, it's obvious, right? They are. 
um, which I think is unfair. It's unfair, really, um, because this issue is so big, and we're talking about people's right to kind of pursue these claims, which are currently pretty impossible to pursue. All right, so if the situation is way over here, and if anything happens to a loved one or a family member of mine, and I feel like medical malpractice is involved just to even knock on the door, you need, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. If that's over here, then we need to at least come back over here a little bit, guys. I mean, that, that much we can agree on, right? Uh, so it's going to be really hot, I think, in the next uh, couple weeks when we see these uh, public hearings um, because it's going to happen. I mean, no matter what, it's going to happen. And Nestor was uh, was mentioning in his report last night when he kind of like gave an overview of, of Bill 112 before the public hearing, he said typically the, the cost if you, that you would have to bear if you're yeah, trying to bring, yeah. bring a claim of course, forth and everything totally. are like around 6000 But you were saying yesterday, more often than not, usually it's around... Well, yeah, because they, when they more. when you look at like whoever you got to bring in all the expert witnesses, yeah. and they were talking about like on the average, that's how much uh, you would spend. Um, but you know, to me, again, and then on the other side with the opposition of of Bill One Twelve, I mean, no matter how you feel, if you do support it, it is concerning that pretty much every single doctor on this island opposes. The, I mean that says something right there whether it says you feel like the doctors are just trying to protect their pocketbook or whether they just all agree that this measure is terrible i mean i gotta hate to say it is what it is but it is what it is i mean you have pretty much every doctor saying oh hell no so we'll see in the public hearings guys uh wow but this is definitely high stakes (laughs) i mean my phone Last night, I'm getting messages from people on all sides. They're like, Chris, look at this. Chris, look at that. Chris, so I'm being torn in every direction here. I mean, you know, I got doctors calling me. I got, you know, people who uh, feel like they've had medical malpractice uh, committed against them and there's nothing they can do about it. So it's it's crazy, guys. People are really going in on all this. And But you know what I'm curious about is this is something where you've obviously got your, I don't want to say lobbies, right? So you got the doctors who are uh, going to be affected by this, and they're really really pushing very strong and then you've got like the little people who probably stand to benefit the most from a measure like this and is that really a fair matchup not really it's not really because the doctors have the power they have the power to say we're not going to do this we're not going to do that and it's scary it's scary to me that they've come out and said hey because you guys are introducing this bill we're not going to treat kids with diabetes like today, they're not, I mean, the thing hasn't even been passed into law yet. So to me, that's kind of, it's just kind of scary because you want the people who are responsible for taking care of your health to kind of like, I don't know, in my opinion, put the nose to the grindstone and take care of your health, right? And we've seen during COVID, something that I haven't really liked so much is we've seen like too much of doctor's politics. In some cases, right? You know what I mean? Uh, and a lot of it is, has been good, right? So when COVID got turned into a political issue, you had doctors on one side who were like, oh, COVID's a lie. And then you had other doctors who were very serious about it. So we've, we've heard a lot of opinions from doctors uh, over the last uh, year. And we've all got to know them, right? And I think that to me, it was just to, to be fair. I'm just saying to be fair. When you have someone who swears an oath to, you know, take care of your health, all of a sudden saying that they don't want to take care of your health because Senator X and Senator Y are introducing a bill, it's troubling to me. It's troubling because now we are seeing politics in places where it shouldn't be. But the doctors, in their defense, I don't even need to defend them, but to be fair, what they're saying, hey, they're bringing the politics to us. So like I said, it's going to be really hot. Uh, they're going to pull out all the stops, guys. Um, but w- where are the doctors who support this thing? Other than we heard from Senator Tello, there was Dr. George Macris, uh, who I guess we'll still and try and get a hold of. But I think that would be like the holy grail. Like if they could find a doctor who said, there's, oh. a name, there's a name we haven't heard in a while. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't that be the holy grail? If they could find a doctor or several doctors 
that come into this public hearing, and maybe they do, maybe they are out there, maybe there are some doctors that say, yeah, we got it too easy right now. Right now, we don't, we're not being held accountable, guys. There's usually, there's usually one, one there's or two be in, one in, or two, in any right. professional community. But, but Jay, there's, I'm just there's saying, always one, dis, one person who, correct, you know, correct, who, who has, you know, the yeah. contrarian voice, and of course. Just, but like I said a few minutes ago, pretty much every single doctor, I mean, yeah, so far, yeah, has signed on to this thing. I mean, you have doctors who hate each other signing on, agreeing. You have Dr. Shea. <laughs> and then I was looking at it, I was like, whoa, Shea and this other guy signed it? Wow, that must be something. So they're actually uniting doctors. Because <laughs> this is a lot, man, let me tell you guys. Okay, and what? With the doctors, there's so much politics on it. I didn't even know until COVID. Like, here, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. Here's my question on that yes, point. Yes, sir, Jay. Was, did you see on... Of the co-signers, was it uh, doctors both in private practice and in working for the public sector? Uh, well, a lot of them do the double duty, man. Yeah. Uh, so I, we'll go through, again, like I said, we're already so behind, uh, but this is such an interesting topic uh, to discuss. And I told my doctor friends, hey, come on the link. Let's go. Let's air it out. Let's talk about it. Because I want to hear specifically what it is that these doctors are saying is going to lead to a shortage. Because right now they're just saying, oh, we don't like Bill 112. It's going to bring medicine back 30 years. Well, why? What is it in that bill that is going to jeopardize the health care of the people of Guam in ways that it's not already being jeopardized today by these doctors saying we're not going to do this and we're not going to do that? And I mean, I'm just trying to be fair and air out both sides here um so we welcome all the debate you know what i mean uh let's do it let's get the doctors let's get the lawyers on and uh, let's go into this in the next couple of weeks uh, it's thursday june 24th 6 48 on the link good morning jason solace in for sabrina sauce Matsunani with the very latest from the KUAM News team, good morning, Jason. All right, we got a lot of news to go to. So right off the top, everybody, last night, six new coronavirus cases out of 363 samples tested on Tuesday. Four people are currently hospitalized. These are cases at GMH and one at Naval Hospital. There have been 8,300-plus officially reported cases. 79 people are in active isolation. And according to JIC, 90,998, too short of 91,000 Isle residents have now been fully vaccinated. This car score has gone down from 0.7 to now 0.6. All right, let's go back to the newsroom where Nestor Lacanto is standing by, including having a profile of yesterday's winners of the week two in the Vax to Win promotion. He's back in the newsroom with your link update. This news update is brought to you by Pacific Points. Do more, get more. The grand prize winners in the second round of Governor Lou Leon Guerrero's Vax and Win incentive program were announced a short while ago at Adeloupe. KUAM's Adriana Cotero spoke to the lucky recipients of a brand new car in $10,000. Gov Guam is pushing to reach herd immunity or 96,000 of the island's population vaccinated by Liberation Day, which is July 21st. In order to ensure this, the governor is enticing the community with weekly grand prize giveaways. And I just want to thank um, the families that are here who have saw the importance of getting vaccinated and really got vaccinated not because they wanted to win something, but because they wanted to win something for their family in terms of their protection, their safety, and the safety of our community. Um, but. They did enter and they did win. The exciting announcement was made by Governor Lou Leon Guerrero and Lieutenant Governor Joshua Tenorio on Wednesday afternoon. Taking home a new 2021 Nissan Versa SR was 74-year-old Jose Ampinko. He received his first Moderna dose on January 13th and his second dose on February 10th. I feel great, but this is the first time I ever win a prize. You don't know when you're going to win. Might as well register now because just like, like, like I said, I never win anything, so as soon as my wife registered me, I was surprised when Crystal called me up this morning and says, are you for real? I says, yes, sir. So, you know, I recommend everybody should register and get their vaccine, vaccine up. And the $10,000 cash prize goes to Petronilo Rodren, who just celebrated his 71st birthday earlier this month on June 8th. Speaking on behalf of Rodrin was his son, Aaron Rodrin. This morning I told him he won this, the prizes, but we don't know yet which one is 
we, if the car is the 10,000, but he's very happy. Rodwin received his first shot of the Moderna vaccine on January 12th and his second dose on February 10th. If we're vaccinated all, it's helped to, not to spread the virus. Thus far, 90,933 island residents are fully immunized, with 51,535 individuals signed up for the program. There is still a chance to enter. All you have to do is get vaccinated, then register on the GVB website. That's visitguam.com backslash vax. Winners are chosen every Wednesday until July 21st. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Adriana Cotero. You may need to get a COVID shot to work at the Department of Corrections. Prison management is working on a policy to require employees to get vaccinated. Here's Tyler Matanani with a story. 72% of the inmate population at the Department of Corrections is vaccinated against COVID, while the vaccination rate for employees is 10% less. DOC spokesman Major Anton Uggin says that while they're encouraging both inmates and employees to get their shots, they're also working on a policy that will mandate it for DOC employees. I'm of the impression that we can order our employees. Based on my research, that this is a public health issue and the nature of our job that we can actually, we should be, we should be requiring our employees to get vaccinated. We're just trying to encourage them right now, but I'll tell you right now, in the next few weeks, we're probably going to put out an order where we're going to have to order them to get vaccinated. Okay. Unless they have medical or uh, religious issues. And as long as nothing is violating the American Disabilities Act, he says they should get the green light. DOC has been in communication with the Attorney General's office to work out the legalities. Government needs to really look at it. I think the governor and her legal team and the AG should be right now at least exploring it. What are the options about having an organization or even the government forcing their employees? You know, Saipan did that and, and seven of their firefighters lost their job. Again said that based on his research of how other states are handling vaccines and employees, the main question being asked is how far can an organization order their employees to get vaccinated? In the end, he says the government has an obligation to protect their workers. If you're an employee here at this department, we have an obligation to provide you a safe working environment. And if that's from a contagious disease like COVID, then we as a department should do what we can to protect you and your family, you know, when you come to work here. He adds that the nature of the job makes it difficult to maintain social distancing and that the inmates are under government care and they have the responsibility to make sure they're safe. If that other virus gets here and starts really spreading, we're going to be in trouble, you know, and we're not sure if Uncle Sam's going to let us out this time. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Tyler Matanani. And COVID-19 vaccinations and testing resumed today at the Dededo Farmers Co-op. They were canceled Tuesday due to inclement weather. KUAM's Isaiah Uggins stopped by the clinic. Shadia Constantine is a physician working on Guam, but is also a wife and mother to three boys. She shares that her family was brought to Guam to get immunized against the coronavirus. My family live in Japan. Um, they are all Americans. Um, I got vaccinated earlier on. So because the rollout in Japan is being so, so slow, I brought them here to get vaccinated. So my husband and my 13-year-old just got the vaccine thanks to Guam. Thank you. Her son, Roman Constantine, received the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. He shared what made him roll up his sleeve. Because I'm 13 and I want to be cured of the coronavirus, I don't see why you need to be scared. I, I'm, I mean, like, the vaccine is good. Shadia's husband, 40-year-old Jonathan Constantine, and 70-year-old Daisy McAwellung of Manila shared why they got vaccinated against COVID-19. I want to contribute to getting rid of this uh, pandemic. You know, I want to be one of the people getting it cleared and hopefully uh, telling more people about it so that everybody gets it. Because we're planning to go f to mainland for family reunion. So I want to make sure that we got everything before we leave. Despite the rainy weather earlier in the week, the COVID-19 combination clinic spearheaded by the Department of Public Health and Social Services and the Guam National Guard went well. Medical Task Force Acting Commander Major Roseanne Aperon said after an hour of operations, about 70 doses of the COVID vaccines were administered. She says those who showed up to get vaccinated share that they are looking forward to winning something from the Vax to Win incentive program. Mostly for their, their, their health and their safety for that of them, themselves and their family members. Uh, they also come through, uh, some of them have heard of the 
VEX AND uh, the, THE RAFFLE DRAWING THAT WE HAVE uh, GOING ON IN THE GOVERNMENT uh, AS A GOOD INCENTIVE. BY THE END OF THE DAY, 100 DOSES OF THE COVID VACCINE WERE ADMINISTERED. AS FAR AS COVID TESTING, DPHSS NURSING RESOURCE COMMAND MARGARITA BALTISTA GAY SAID TESTING WAS SLOW WEDNESDAY MORNING COMPARED TO LAST WEEK WHERE 100 SAMPLES WERE TESTED. SO WE, we JUST HAD ONE WITH uh, LOST OF TASTE AND SMELL, uh, COUGHING, SLIGHT FEVER, SORE THROAT, uh, RUNNY NOSE. THOSE ARE COMMON SYMPTOMS FOR FLU, BUT BECAUSE OF COVID, THEY'RE SCARED THAT IT MIGHT BE COVID. Okay. So they're, ju they're just making sure that they're safe. She also shared that 60 people were tested with 90 specimens collected today at the clinic. Reporting for Guam's News Network, Guahu C. Isaiah Uggen. The 20 positive COVID-19 cases reported recently were a result of family exposure, with a majority of them not vaccinated. Acting Public Health Medical Officer Chima Mwakwan says they were identified through contact tracing of the 20 positives. 15 had not gotten their COVID shots yet, and three were not eligible. Despite the rise in positive cases, Mbakwan says for now, there's nothing to worry about. All of them were true case investigation. So we had uh, index cases. The team went out and um, conducted interviews, were able to identify their contacts, and then they were tested and they were all positive. So I think um, we don't really have to lose too much sleep because um, it's contained now. As well, the majority of the positive individuals were symptomatic and that's what da what's dangerous, explains Mbakwan. Now, even when you do the temperature checks, um, when you're going into buildings, you, you, you seem to understand that you can't even detect these people who are positive. So it is a, is a, is a huge balance between you know, personal responsibility, you, know, you wearing your mask to protect yourself as against hoping that the temperature checks at the door would catch someone who is sick. But at this point, we're looking at, we're seeing more asymptomatic people walking around with the virus. Mbakum says wearing the mask is a form of intervention for individual protection, whether vaccinated or not. In other news, more tangible evidence of how federal assistance has helped prop up the economy. The government's total revenue collections have surpassed projections. Through the month of May, GovGuam took in some $6.4 million more than expected. According to the latest Consolidated Revenue and Expenditure Report, which tracks the government's budget, as of May, GovGuam collected some $558 million in general fund revenues compared to its projected $551.8 million. Budget Director Lester Carlson says the big boost came from income taxes as the filing deadline was pushed back to May. You see that individual, you know, we collected $22 million more, uh, corporate, 2.8 more, withholding 2.8 more. We did um, collect $6.4 million more total than what we anticipated. Um, if it, and then you take that number um, and you project forward all things being equal, um, you know, we're still looking at um, exceeding the adopted level by $6.4 million. That's the good news. Not so good is the fact that come September, most direct federal assistance will end, and the unemployed and underemployed, says Carlson, need to find work to keep the economy from sputtering. I'm really hoping, though, Esther, that people um, take heed of the fact that, yes, there's been a lot of federal dollars in for people that uh, were displaced, um, due to the pandemic, but there's a, everybody's looking for, work, for for employees these days, everybody. That and an uptick in tourism through the Air VNV program, he says, will sustain government revenues. I'm very optimistic that the, uh, the tracking of the BPT, you know, will, will you know, uh, kind of catch up, especially when we are able to host more guests and those guests spend more money. But with further federal help uncertain, the fiscal year 2022 budget will likely be a different matter. The governor still has some $600 million at her disposal, but while senators have been urging Adloop to release a spending plan, Carlson says they won't until the Treasury releases the final spending rules in July. By the time the legislature gets ready to um, sit down formally, 
will also have the information to be able to provide. And I think collectively, we, you know, we should be able to, to do some things. The legislature has until the end of August to pass a final budget. After a new dengue fever case was confirmed on Wednesday, public health urges residents to continue prevention measures, especially during the rainy weather. The island hasn't had a dengue case since February of 2020, but on Monday, public health received laboratory-confirmed diagnosis. Dengue fever is a mosquito-borne tropical disease caused by the dengue virus. However, it's not contagious and can't be spread from person to person. Public Health Information Officer Janela Carrera said it's such a coincidence this happened now because it's National Mosquito Control Awareness Week. Now is a great time to really exercise, you know, these, these tips. Um, if you have any flower pots, you know, the, the base of the flower pots, sometimes the, the uh, water tends to collect around that area. Make sure you constantly check and throw it out. Um, if you have old tires, that are you know hanging uh, just around your yard um, make sure you throw out the water that tends to pond at the bottom uh, part of it um, you know the the back side of your house or the sides of your house where there's um, the drip from your air conditioning um, make sure it's not collecting in certain areas the case is a resident of Dededo and public health is continuing surveillance of the area to further prevent the spread. This news update is brought to you by Pacific Points. Do more, get more. All right, let's take a look at what's happening on the national circuit now as fewer people are getting vaccinated for COVID-19 and that is fueling concerns about a possible resurgence of the disease. CBS's Dana Backus is in the City of Angels with the latest on the fight against coronavirus in the mainland. The White House says the U.S. will fall short of President Biden's goal of having 70 percent of adults vaccinated by Independence Day. We don't see it exactly like something went wrong. Uh, how we see it is we set a bold, ambitious goal. We are expected to meet that goal uh, just a couple weeks after July 4th. Aides downplayed the significance of missing the target, but acknowledged a need to get more people immunized, particularly those under the age of 30. The reality is many younger Americans have felt like COVID-19 is not something that impacts them, and they've been less eager to get the shot. 79% of Americans 50 and up have gotten at least one dose of COVID vaccine. That rate falls to 47% among those aged 18 to 24. Nearly every death due to COVID-19 is particularly tragic because nearly every death, especially among adults due to COVID-19, is at this point entirely preventable. The declining vaccination rate has coincided with the rise of a new coronavirus strain that's thought to be more contagious. The Delta variant is currently the greatest threat in the U.S., to our attempt to eliminate COVID-19. Experts say the variant is responsible for more than 20% of all new infections. That's double what it was just a week ago. Don back is CBS News, Los Angeles. And as always, everybody, make sure to check out us out at KUAM.com or any of our social media platforms for the very latest Guam news headlines. Uh, Chris, we have a special guest in the Zoom room right now. We sure do. Uh, you're going to be uh, discussing with Jason uh, what they hope to get out of this uh, economic forum, the things that they're looking forward to uh, seeing uh, discussed and the things they want to discuss from the Guam uh, Chamber, Catherine Castro. And ladies and gentlemen, live here on the link, the one and only Jason Solace. And Any time we get to spend with uh, with Kathy is is a treat. We're talking about, you know, what the island's doing to recover the support that she's giving to businesses of all scope. And also because she's in Tuman, and I love Tuman. So, uh, Madam President, good morning. Half a day. Good to see you as always. Half a day. Good morning. I'm not sure if you can hear me. I'm here in the lobby. I can. You, you're you're coming through five by five. You're perfect. Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> yeah. So. So. Yeah. So before we get into it, I know that there is there is so much um, anticipation and anxiety and optimism. You know, the the, the emotions uh, run the gamut. I think that's a very very good thing from a business standpoint. Um, can you kind of contextualize here we are maybe about like 56 minutes away from today's economic forum uh, from the people that have already showed up and everything like that. What does the the tempo and what's the, what's the feeling that you get being on the floor? I think that, you know, there is very, very positive, you know, thoughts. I think that we've come this far already and, you know, we've got the 
um, the vaccination tourism that is already in swing. Uh, there's very positive reports that folks are very, very interested in participating. Um, so it's just a matter of just, uh, I think, uh, just very clarification on guidance and, and just making sure that we can truly open at 100% by July 21st. I think, the, I think those, those are the main things that we really, really want to know. And, and, and just to be able to, uh, as businesses, uh, fully uh, utilize the resources so that we can uh, um, open when our, our guests finally arrive and, and be at, at, at the capacity that we need to be and not be able to have people waiting in lines you know, you know, we're known for our hospitality. We're known for our holiday spirit, right? And so, the last thing that we want to do is have have our guests, you know, expectations of being here and having a great experience, um, uh, not be not have that type of experience. So, uh, again, so that's what we're looking for. We want to make sure that we're able to um, know what these expectations are truly, because you know, there's these all of these various. Um, uh, you know, uh, interpretations, I guess, uh, not, it's not very clear. And so we just want to make sure that we're all on the same page and, and, and that we have a really, really firm timeline that we can work with. Okay. Th th that's absolutely pragmatic. And that takes me into my next question, because, you know, from your standpoint and, you know, the chair you sit in um, from a leaders has been, you know, um, yeah. you know, stay the course, cut corners where you can, yeah. you know, things are going to get really, really mm -hmm. tough, but, you know, um, get creative, you know, um, you know, try as best you can to do this. But uh, but obviously there have been, uh, you know, casualties in the membership. Several businesses have, you know, regrettably had to shut down. Uh, have you been thinking in the past, you know, maybe a couple of days and even now as as you prepare for this, um, what your message is going to be leading up to Liberation Day? And, you know, what kind of what kind of guidance, what kind of motivation uh, you can give to people about moving from recovery back to a somewhat normal operational tempo? Well, you know, I don't think we're normal, um, mm -hmm. Jason. I think that we're a long way from normal, but we are certainly uh, in recovery. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it's a long road for a lot of businesses and for a lot of people. And we just have to, uh, you know, just be, you know, understand where we really are at and, and, uh, and know what the challenges that we're really going to be facing uh, in the days to come, right? I mean, especially with the, um, uh, the ending of PUA, um, maybe by uh, approximately around the Labor Day timeline, and, and having folks that uh, are not going to have that weekly paycheck. And that is a big, big concern, mm -hmm. right? We want to, uh, you know, uh, as a community, we have to be prepared for these things and how are we going to support these individuals and 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 continue to um, as a community uh be able to uh, uh continue to do business and uh and 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 have be safe doing this right and then to have uh to have a message to the international world that guam is safe and guam is a good place to be we're the safe haven we're the jewel in the Pacific, and and uh, and so so you know, there's a lot of things that we still have to do as 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 residents and as a local community, mm -hmm. but um, we have come so far, and it is because of our great community that we are here at this very place, right? And it, it is because of everybody's diligence, everybody's you know uh, uh, practicing of safety protocols. And, and, and we have to really be proud of ourselves to be here. And compared to other places in the United States, we're in a really good place. So let's continue to be vigilant. That's what we have to be. We can't let down our guard. We have to continue to be diligent, diligent, but let us move forward. That is so key and it is so important. We have to have be able to utilize our entire resources in order for us to be able to say, okay, you need a job. I have a, I have a place for you. But if we can't do that, then we unfortunately cannot offer those jobs. Mm -hmm. Now, from, from a more macro standpoint, Kathy, um, what, what are you envisioning or maybe what have you thought about as far as, you know, maybe using um, 
you know, the lessons that we can take away from the coronavirus uh, era? Because th there are a lot of people in our community who would maybe say, you know, from adversity comes opportunity. And maybe as far as, you know, shoring up our island hospitality to not have so many eggs in a basket as far as, you know, being solely dependent on tourism and everything like that. And, you know, maybe what uh, what wisdom can we take away um, to apply, you know, towards uh, towards industry going forward? You know, there's so many exercises that are going on right now. Like, for example, the chamber is actually reviewing our strategic plan um, that uh, is so important because of the, you know, what has occurred because of the pandemic. Uh, as you well know, we are ha have a partnership with the, the government of Guam in um, putting together economic diversification initiatives, right? And so I think that uh, it is, you know, <laughs> this pandemic has shown us that we cannot solely uh, uh, put our eggs in one in basket, as you said. Mm -hmm. uh, we cannot, you know, we've, we've got a two-legged stool, right? We've got tourism and we have the federal government. Uh, and, and we obviously cannot uh, rely on that. It's, 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 it's not good for our people. It's not, it, we just, and it's not good for our economy. So uh, we, I think as a business community and as a government, have recognized that and are moving diligently and fastidiously uh, to uh, make things happen in other areas and other ways. So I think that the, the community um, needs to be able to embrace that and, and, and be open to opportunities that, um, that are going to be good for Guam and for our people. So I, I'm, I'm very, very positive that some of these economic initiatives are going to come to fruition and it's going to be good for us. We just have to be able to um, look at them in positive light and, and embrace it. And we know you're speaking from, from a standpoint as, as an entrepreneur and as, as someone who, who speaks honestly because, you know, you've never sugarcoated anything as many times as we've had you on the show. And if, if things are really getting bad, you always state it as such. And you're like, okay, you know, we're going to be hurting for quite a while and like i said you know do you see us going to a somewhat normal way of life and you're like you know i don't think that's going to be the case for for at least you know i mean probably not even the short term maybe maybe the medium term so you know i mean we appreciate your candor in that regard and i'm sure your members do as well yeah so you know again uh that and that's the reason why we're asking for that that number is is it really july 21 mm -hmm. right because you know especially for the tourism industry there's so many moving parts, right? There's relocation of assets, right? As far as even airplanes, you know, we need to be able to get our people that want to come to Guam internationally. Well, we need more airplanes to come here, right? And then with airplanes, there's all of the infrastructure that goes with that, right? And then there's the marketing that's a part of that. And there's just so much things that, that are, um, you know, uh, surround that particular industry that is just not going to happen exactly. in, in a month. Right. Yeah, so, we, we've so had people on the show who, who have told us that they said, you know, the, um, from a marketing or from a branding, from a um, from a feel good standpoint, you know, targeting Liberation Day would be, you know, it's a it's a real nice, clever tie in. Um, but maybe maybe the date was arbitrarily selected and everything like that. And like you said, you know, for implementation, is that really like a good date? And hopefully um, the presentations today are going to uh, uh, going to cover that. I wanted to kind of say on that on that note, Kathy, um, there are a whole bunch of information sessions and we, we highly encourage everybody please make sure if you are interested in uh the information to be presented today go and register it's a zoom webinar um so it's free for, free for the public to attend virtually if you're not there in, uh, dot org or their facebook page and you can register to watch it um there are presentations kathy on vaccine tourism um the essential tools of what we need going forward the qr code program uh, results of UOG's coronavirus study, and then uh, some other things. Um, will you personally be be sitting on um, panels, or will you be presenting, or you know, moderating any forums? I'm 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 providing opening remarks. Excellent. Um, we do have a uh, University of Guam, uh, really great folks who are going to be moderating our event today, and we have uh, several uh, government of Guam okay. agencies, then the Physicians Advisory Group. Uh, Surgeon South, uh, Public Health, Department of Labor, all of these folks that make it happen. Governor Guam is also going to provide opening remarks. We're super excited that she's going to be here today. I think this is going to be a really good event for everybody to learn a little bit more about 
you know, uh, so that we can plan. And, and mm-hmm. so we're encouraging everybody. And I, and I understand from Mary that KUAM is also being a great supporter today and uh, could possibly um, uh, uh, do the live feed as well. We so, are. And, and so thank you so much for your wonderful support. We truly appreciate it. Absolutely. We're, we're you know, we're dying to see the, the information as much as you are and everything. And on that note, I, w- I want to give you, you know, I, I would never ask you to steal the shine of our beloved governor, but we've been hearing, Kathy, that that Governor Leon Guerrero is supposed to make uh, what some are saying, like a very significant, a landmark announcement today. Do you have any idea or can you give us a hint at, at what that might be? <laughs> I do not. I'm so sorry. And um, I mean, probably okay. even if that la- that no, lap no, was a little no, 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 that no, no, lap I'm was sorry. a little duplicitous. I think I think you yeah. know. Yeah, we got history, <laughs> Kathy. Don't come around here with that smile saying, "Oh no, what? I don't know anything." Kathy, you're among friends here on the link. <laughs> yeah. It's a safe place. Just come on, between man. us, girls. Come on. <laughs> yeah. You know, I love you guys. Uh, I right. just don't have that information. Give me something, Kathy. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> you got to tune in. You got to tune in. That's <laughs> oh, why go. this is such an important event. Well, you know, we're gonna be streaming your opening remarks. So break a leg. All right. Thank you so All much. Right. See you, Kathy. We, look, we look forward to it. Congratulations again. Good luck. Yeah, she knows. Totally. Right. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she knows. Right <laughs> look, look at that. She's got yeah, that, that, yeah. that's a million dollar yeah. smile yeah. right there. She's like, yep. All right, seven eighteen. We'll take a break. Uh, Can't get anybody to budge on this thing, man. We are we are like working all the back channels. We're making calls. We're sending WhatsApp messages yep. and everything like that, but tight lips so far. I heard it might have been something about the link is our favorite morning show. Maybe. We'll take a break, guys. Uh, we're coming back with what? <laughs> what? Nice. <laughs> All right. I'll take that. We're coming back with uh, more of the show next. Good morning. KUAM News, in partnership with the Guam Visitors Bureau, brings you the Guam Safe and WTTC Safe Travel Certified Program Showcase. Look out for this powerful symbol for visitors, island residents, and industry workers alike, as it represents establishments with a consistent global commitment to safety practices. Stamped with approval by the Guam Visitors Bureau and the World Travel Tourism Council. Every Monday on KUAM News, we'll feature a different local business who's taken the Safe Guam and Safe Travels pledge to maintain health and safety standards to get Guam back on track. Log on to visitguam.com to see how your business can receive the designation, what businesses in our community are Guam Safe certified, and have the WTTC Safe Travel certified. Do you feel like you're missing out on something? Make life more rewarding with Pacific Points. Earn and redeem points for bill rebates and free load at IT&E, discounts on fuel at Shell, vouchers at foodies and united mileage plus miles you can even pay with pacific points at itne shell and foodies pacific points do more get more family platter of fried chicken check tray of red rice check birthday cake check one case of water check 12 pack of beer check two cases of pepsi check when you have a long checklist but are short on time we got you get it delivered by us order on the app or website at uno-go.com guam on demand shoot i forgot the paper product oh wait uno go has that too After a year with so many games and events delayed or unplayed, the world is ready for anything and everything in the world of sports. KUAM Communications is ready with more games, more championships, and more specials that are guaranteed to bring out the fan in you. Don't miss a minute of gameplay from NBC on KUAM TV 8 or from CBS on KUAM TV 11. Every month, we'll bring you the action and excitement. Brought to you locally by Michelob Ultra, Superior Light Beer, Marianas Irrigation and Landscape, and Docomo Pacific. Just more great reasons to tune in and turn on so you'll fall in love with TV again with the best from KUAM Communications. Catch SportsLink on the KUAM News Morning Show, The Link, every Friday to hear about the latest in sports news, game schedules, athlete profiles, and more. SportsLink, brought to you each week by Cure Alkaline Water and Mariana's Irrigation and Landscape, airs every Friday across the multimedia platforms of KUAM. Tune into the broadcast on Breeze 93.9 FM on KUAM TV 11, live streaming through the KUAM News Facebook page, or view highlights on YouTube, KUAM News Facebook, and Instagram. SportsLink is hosted by Dave Delgado through KUAM Sports, and he will make sure that everyone knows what is happening on the fields, in the gyms, and everywhere in between.
connection is a human necessity, one we need today more than ever. And with the new First Hawaiian Bank mobile app, you can stay just as connected to your finances. And it all starts with yes. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. The relationship between Guam and Manila, Philippines is undeniable as we share similar cultural traditions, history, and heritage with generations of Filipinos calling Guam home. KUAM presents a monthly look at the capital city featuring in-depth and engaging interviews on everything from medical tourism to new business and government leaders. Veteran newscaster Nestor Lecanto delivers Beyond Our Borders. This special program is brought to you by the Bank of Guam and KFC. Looking for TV schedules, upcoming sports, or special presentations, or what you may have missed over the busy week you had? Well, look no further than KOM Digital Digest. This weekly email newsletter puts all kinds of information in the hands of subscribers each and every week. Just subscribe, and we will make sure you keep up with your favorites and stay informed and entertained throughout it all. Go to KOM.com, click on the newsletter tab, give us your email address, and you are all set. Brought to you in digital partnership with King's Restaurant and Ruby Tuesday Guam. It's the KOM Digital Digest, your weekly guide to the latest information and best entertainment on the stations and platforms of KUAM. Help us celebrate the class of 2021. KUAM wants to help you celebrate this touchstone moment in the lives of your graduates. For the months of May and June, we will flood the social media pages of KUAM with photos and well wishes for the class of 2021 grads. Log on to KUAM.com to submit photos and brief messages or captions. Then look for your special grad on KUAM Instagram and the Facebook pages. From all of your friends here at KUAM, congratulations, seniors! I decided to get vaccinated because just thinking about all the lives lost from COVID and everyone on island that contracted the illness, I realized that I need to do my part, not just to protect myself, but our community. And I also realized we're still not out of the woods with variants that are out there. I want to be safe and I want to keep my family safe. I'm Tyler Matsunani, and I'm a proud member of the vaccination. Join the vaccination, scan and plan. For more information, go to KUAM.com. Brought to you by American Medical Center, your partner in healthcare. The world of television is more exciting than ever. Don't miss a minute of special presentations from NBC on KUAM TV 8 or from CBS on KUAM TV 11. Every month, we'll bring you the fun and excitement of award shows and red carpet moments, special series presentations, and other great network programs. Brought to you locally by King's Restaurant, Ruby Tuesday Guam, Bud Light Seltzer, and Docomo Pacific. Giving you more reasons to tune in and turn on. Fall in love with TV again with the best from KUAM Communications. KUAM's multi-platform morning show, The Link, just got a little more delicious with Feed Me Fridays. Chris, Sabrina, Jason, and the rest of the morning crew will take some time each Friday to talk food, taste food, and bring you all the latest and greatest in food from King's Restaurants and Ruby Tuesday Guam. Old faves, new hits, and everything on the menu in between. It's Feed Me Fridays on The Link. And Sabrina at 637-0094 on Breeze 93.9 FM.
All right, good stuff. Remember, we only do local music here on the link. Proudly. Proud, proud. 728. Let's go to do Cover Me. Jay, tell us a little bit uh, more about this morning's uh, Cover Me. Well, we picked this one because this is one of the most creative music videos you're going to find. Um, don't want to give away too much, but just think. In the Jungle, Romantic Story, brilliant cinematography. I, mm. I got to tell you, this is, this is shot amazingly. And it's got a really, really good You had me at In the Jungle. <laughs> Everything after that was like, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> Uh, it's brought to you by Burger King and Docomo Pacific. Cover me. Good morning.
Sunday's multi-platform morning show. Do you feel like you're missing out on something? Make life more rewarding with Pacific Points. Earn and redeem points for bill rebates and free load at ITE. Discounts on fuel at Shell, vouchers at Foodies, and United Mileage Plus Miles. You can even pay with Pacific Points at ITE, Shell, and Foodies. Pacific Points. Do more, get more. June makes the best malasadas in Hawaii. A fact not lost on Daryl, whose brother Byron is cooking the onaga he caught at a secret fishing spot with his girlfriend Malia, who used to work for the Shave Ice Guy, whose second cousin Vince drives the school bus ridden by Kalei, whose auntie makes the best malasadas in Hawaii. Everything here is connected, and with the new First Hawaiian Bank mobile app, you can stay just as connected to your finances, and it all starts with yes. Uno Go, delivering meals from your favorite restaurants and more, including delivering sodas and adult beverages from the Bottle Shack. Visit uno-go.com or download the app today. Also, follow them on Instagram and Facebook. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. Looking for TV schedules, upcoming sports, or special presentations, or what you may have missed over the busy week you had? Well, look no further than KOM Digital Digest. This weekly email newsletter puts all kinds of information in the hands of subscribers each and every week. Just subscribe, and we will make sure you keep up with your favorites and stay informed and entertained throughout it all. Go to KOM.com, click on the newsletter tab, give us your email address, and you are all set. Brought to you in digital partnership with King's Restaurant and Ruby Tuesday Guam. It's the KOM Digital Digest, your weekly guide to the latest information and best entertainment on the stations and platforms of KUAM. KUAM Communications continues our perpetuation of our Samoro culture, language, and heritage with features available to our listening and viewing audience, including streaming of Samoro music 24 hours per day on Isla Digital Radio on KUAM.com and the KUAM News app. Samoro News Update, weekdays on the link and the KUAM News YouTube channel. Conversations about life in our Samoro language podcast with Tosta Pogu with Kin Conception. Seasonal specials, shows and other features highlighting the beauty of our language, culture, and history. It's a new era of our continued commitment to our tomorrow heritage. Isla, watch, listen, stream, Viva Isla! I decided to get vaccinated because I knew that it was the only way to keep myself, my family, friends, and everyone safe. And it was also my way of contributing to the fight against COVID-19. And I also encourage everyone out there, and especially those in the FSM communities here on Guam, to do your part and get vaccinated. My name is Victorious Flan, and I am a proud member of the vaccination. Join the vaccination. Scan and plan. For more information, go to KUAM.com. Brought to you by American Medical Center, your partner in healthcare. The relationship between Guam and Manila, Philippines is undeniable as we share similar cultural traditions, history, and heritage with generations of Filipinos calling Guam home. KUAM presents a monthly look at the capital city featuring in-depth and engaging interviews on everything from medical tourism to new business and government leaders. Veteran newscaster Nestor Lecanto delivers Beyond Our Borders. This special program is brought to you by the Bank of Guam and KFC.
38. Good morning. One time. Hundley. Taxi driver, 738. Again, Pacific Points. Making the points at all shell of foodies. Jack in the Box, Cabo Enterprises, IT&E. This is the link. Morning, Chief of Police. Chief Steve Ignacio joins us in the KUM News Zoom Room. Good morning, Chief. Thank you for your time. No problem, Chris. Good morning. Morning, morning. All right. Uh, we'll just get right into it. Uh, Sabrina's on leave, so you got me and Jason. Uh, but we, we wanted to start something we haven't heard about uh, in a bit is this uh, extradition case of Nicholas Moore uh, as the prime suspect in the uh, alleged uh, murder of Michael Castro. Have there been any updates? Has Mr. Moore been uh, returned to Guam? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, as, as I said, uh, he's still in the custody of the United States Marshal Service. And so until such time that uh, they bring him back to Guam, uh, we'll know more as to where we uh, go from, from there. Uh, but no, he's still in their custody, so I don't know what the movements are. And I'm sure uh, we're, we're not going to know uh, for purposes of security uh, until he gets here. Have there been any other uh, arrests uh, in this case? Uh, none that I'm tracking, uh, but you know I do know that there's still a lot of uh, investigative work that's being done by criminal investigation, and so uh, we continue to move forward on that. Well, that's uh, encouraging, uh, Chief. So, can can you kind of explain uh, a little bit, uh, just generally, on the ex- extradition process, just for maybe uh, some of us who aren't familiar with it, like what it entails, timeline? Sure. So, so with uh, with the the Nicholas Moore case. Uh, it was a little bit different from what I what uh, I was used to. I've actually done um, three uh, extraditions uh, to Guam. Uh, I did one in St. Louis. I'm sorry, Palmyra, Missouri, which is about eight hours out from St. Louis. Uh, I did one to Chuk, and I did one in Saipan. So it was very different. Um, my experiences were very different. Uh, as a matter of fact, I brought that that experience to uh, to the team, and they're like, "No, chief, that's not how it's done." uh now nowadays i said okay so we they kind of walked me through and so what it is is that uh we brought our case uh to the u.s marshals and uh they presented it before uh the district court judge and uh, a warrant was issued for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution uh meaning that you know uh, uh more uh left Guam uh because of the ongoing investigation and the fact that uh you know there may be evidence against him that uh, could bring charges for uh, the murder. And so once we turned it over to the U.S. Marshals and they got the, uh, what's called the UFAP, Unlawful Flight to Avoid Prosecution Warrant, uh, everything now falls into their hands. Uh, They uh, go out and send their teams. Uh, You know, they have a bigger, uh, uh, they they have jurisdiction throughout the United States. So um, they were able to track down uh, Mr. Moore's uh, location in Florida. once they got the warrant and uh, we uh, we actually send um, and then you know these are things that we do that we don't always normally uh, publicly talk about but uh, as this thing progressed uh, and we were coordinating with the U.S. Marshal Service uh, we actually send uh, two of our uh, agents from criminal investigation uh, out to Florida uh, to work with um, uh, the U.S. Marshals so that once they picked up uh, Nicholas Moore uh, we could step in and uh, attempt to conduct an interrogation or interview regarding the the case and of course um i'm not sure what the outcome was or whether or not he provided any statements uh but you know we were there when he was picked up and then you know we went around and did uh investigative work you know we talked to whoever he may have been living with whether it's just a family a friend a relative and see if that they had any information as to um that they could provide that may be helpful in the uh, uh investigation that we're conducting and uh, once that's done, uh, he's brought before that that uh, court in uh, Florida, and at that point, you know, uh, he determines uh, they they determine of whether or not um, he can be extradited back to Guam, based on the the warrant issued by the uh, the court here in Guam, the district court. Uh, and it's my understanding that uh, uh, Nicholas, Nicholas Moore did not uh, contest uh, his identity, and uh, so he agreed to be flown back to Guam in the custody of the U.S. Marshals. So that's where we're at now, and, uh, you know, we're we're working on getting him back home so that we can proceed in the local court. Are the uh, two officers that uh, were sent off to Florida when he was apprehended, have they returned to Guam? Uh, Yes, they're back on island already. 
They're back home safe. Uh, what about the issue of the uh, drug test, uh, Chief? I know we had uh, followed up with you, was it like a week, week or two ago? Uh, have all the officers uh, been tested, and what can you share with our audience? Sure. Uh, matter of fact, um, if you don't see me for a little bit, let me just open up that email. Okay. And so, Chris, we, we tested a total of 163 employees. Uh, out of the entire police department, which represents about, um, I think, 75%. So we, we actually almost reached our goal. There, there may have been, may have been a couple here and there that um, weren't tested, and uh, for various reasons, either they were on sick leave, annual leave, uh, off island, or uh, even military leave. Uh, but uh, we, we did uh, do do quite a few uh, tests for our employees, and uh, glad to report that all the tests came back uh, negative. Oh, well. And then, uh, so you mentioned that some may have missed it uh, because of uh, various uh, commitments. Do you then kind of go back and uh, make an effort to test everyone who didn't, or are we just stopping? Uh, we, we could, but, you know, as you see the trend, you know, all of our officers are, and our employees, uh, because some of the, the civilian employees actually fall into a, a test-designated position. Mm. Uh, for example, our criminalists, it's my understanding that our criminalists uh, were subjected to testing. Uh, because of the fact that they deal with um, uh, drug evidence and, uh, you know, uh, they work in that environment. So they were sub some of them were subjected to the random tests. Uh, and again, uh, all of our employees tested uh, negative. So, you know, uh, I, I guess, you know, I'm comfortable uh, that I can move on and then, you know, maybe follow up uh, testing maybe next year uh, if, you know, if time permits. Are you obviously you're pleased uh, with the results, Chief? Oh, yes, absolutely. You know, it, it, it shows, you know, that our officers are above board and, uh, you know, adhering to uh, the, the law. And, you know, uh, we, we can count on them and we can trust them. Uh, it's very, very, uh, very, very good results. Can, can you give us an update on the, uh, so there was that Project U and then there was like a COVID case, right? And that threw everybody involved with that into uh, quarantine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, uh, glad to report uh, they came back on the, I think last week, Wednesday was the new uh, start date. And so we just kind of pushed everything to the right. And so, you know, of course, uh, completion date is probably sometime in July. But, uh, you know, I had a chance to meet some of the kids. You know, it's a very small group, a uh, very small intimate group. So we had um, six of them showed up uh, when I met them, I believe, uh, Monday of this week. And uh, it was a maximum of 10. So it's a very small group, but, uh, you know, I'm excited, you know, because we have these kids and we're able to work with them and, uh, you know, be a positive, um, influence in their life and you know we teach them life skills so uh there's a lot of great partners you know thrive uh, trades academy uh, manietlu um you know dya guam behavioral health you know there's a whole bunch of people that came forward and says you know we, we we like the project we want to be a part of it and uh you know uh, we're here to support you and uh come come out and uh, give give our all to it too so uh, doe as well so it's it's moving, and uh, I'm glad to report that um, you know uh, no, no other positives, and uh, we can continue. And um, yeah, the other thing, Chris, is uh, this Friday. You know, I'd, let me just <laughs> be the first to announce that this Friday we'll be uh, doing our swearing in uh, of our new police recruits, and they'll be hitting the streets uh, come Sunday. And uh, they'll, they'll be this will be their uh, swearing in just for the OJT. But you know, at this point, you know, moving forward, uh, they're, they're going to have all the uh, duties and responsibilities of a full-time peace officer, able to make arrests, take complaints, and all that. And so, uh, we'll be swearing in 21 new recruits, and uh, they'll be out assisting with our our shortage in the, the police department. Uh, they'll be working with their field training officers, and you know, get them um, get them to experience uh, r real uh, real life uh, police work. Chief, uh, so how, when they get folded into the rotation, <clears throat> what does that mean in terms of you moving around uh, personnel who maybe had been moved somewhere to cover shortages that these recruits are not going to fill? Yeah, so so once they they're done with their um, OJT, uh, which is uh, uh, eight eight weeks, uh, we're going to be doing uh, two weeks per precinct, uh, just so that they can uh, experience each precinct. Because you know, I'll tell you. Uh, I, we all know, uh, police officers all know that uh, precincts are very different. Um, the type of people you deal with, um, the nature of the work, the amount, the workload uh, is very different from precinct to precinct. You know, it may be a little bit 
slower down south, but it allows the officers to be more proactive, make, make uh, be able to patrol more, pull over more cars, and then that's where we run into the, the possession cases, right? Uh, the street level possession cases of uh, drug paraphernalia. Uh, you get up to Derrido, and you know you just you can't you know, can't keep up, you know, in Derrido sometimes, you know, because uh, we cover Derrido and Jigo. There's multiple calls. I mean, it's not unusual sometimes, you know, that Derrido would have to call uh, to morning to kind of move up and help uh, cover down because there's two riots going on at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. That That's not unusual up in the, the north. Uh, to morning again, is a, a different animal because, you know, uh, there's no more tourists, right? There's very little tourists, if none at all. So that that dynamic has pretty uh, pretty much changed down in uh, Tawani. Uh, and then we go to the central area and we cover the most villages with the, you know, we, we have the most mayors there and a uh, uh, population that's uh, almost equal to the north, uh, but just more area to cover because multiple jurisdictions. Yeah, so uh, they, they get to experience all of that. Uh, they de get to do a two week rotation, work night shift, work day shift. Uh, come back in eight weeks, and then we prepare them for their formal uh, ceremony, the graduation, and they head back out. You know, those that have performed well uh, during OJT, uh, they're recommended to uh, go out and patrol on their own. Uh, sometimes um, those that don't, uh, you know, perform that 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 well, you know, we continue to put them through with an FTO until, you know, we get to a comfortable place that uh, they can function uh, on their own. But uh, as far as the shortage, you know, of course, first priority is, and I've always said this, Chris, is um, making sure that we have enough officers on patrol. And uh, once, you know, we were comfortable that we can at least establish a minimum coverage for patrol and, and meet that minimum coverage, uh, then, you know, we're, we're going to have to look at moving officers to possibly, uh, my next priority will probably be investigations bureau. Uh, because cases that don't get closed at the patrol level, uh, end up at Investigations Bureau, CID, uh, CIS, you know, criminal investigation, juvenile investigation, uh, and uh, those places. So, you know, that's where the, the, the need, uh, the next need would be. And, uh, and you know, uh, that, that's what we're doing. You know, uh, just this week, I was informed again that, um, I, I think, I don't know if I reported last week that I lost uh, yeah, a civilian. Yeah. Yeah, and a police officer. But uh, again, uh, this week, you know, I had another officer who actually works in one of uh, the small offices here under the chief of police. Uh, he'll be retiring soon. And uh, another officer I heard is going to be submitting his letter of uh, retirement soon as well. So this week uh, I'll be having to <laughs> be processing uh, two retirements. Well, you, Chief, I ran into a retired officer uh, over the weekend and um, they were they were talking about a uh, program. I'm not even sure if it's just something that was discussed or if it's uh, in the works or or not. But a program to bring back uh, retired officers as reservists um, is that just something that's being talked about, or was there an offer made, or can you tell us anything on that? So uh, you know, we we we've, we've told uh, the, the retirees that you know if they want to come back, uh, you know, they're, they're more than welcome. Actually, during the, the pandemic. Uh, we actually picked up one former officer uh, and one retired police officer. Matter of fact, the retired police officer is still working with us, and they actually don't come back as a reserve. Uh, they actually come back as a full-time uh, police officer. Uh, I think the only thing is that they don't receive um, retirement benefit. We don't pay into their retirement because they're already retired. Uh -huh. Uh, and then we don't, uh, they don't accrue annual sick leave is my understanding of that. Uh, it's what's, what's allowed under the budget law. But uh, we, we did pick up uh, one one retired police officer and he's still uh, on board with us. Um, and he's still working actually out of the Dedito precinct. Wow. And uh, the, the, the other officer, of course, you know, her uh, one year came up and uh, she decided that it's time for her to move on. Uh, we've always opened it up for our retirees. And, uh, you know, we've talked about them coming back. You know, they, they wanted to help. Uh, one of the things that you know that I've always, has always been a hindrance uh, sometimes is uh, um, the fact that you know they have to meet the, the post requirements as well, mm. and so you know they have to be subjected to a, a polygraph, a background, and a psyche valve. And uh, you know, a retiree, you know they they've spent uh, all their time, but uh, really, um, you know, it's always been open. Um, We've tried to get, we were trying to get a police reserve cycle uh, up and started uh, or up and running, but 
you know, our challenge is that, you know, we, we went through like 20 applicants and only six of them uh, actually meet that requirement of having um, the, the basic law enforcement academy or the CJ academy from GCC. Uh, and that's only so that it can minimize the amount of training that we, we right. put into it because they've already received, you know, probably 80, 90% of it. But, uh, you know, we can't start an academy with six people. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. So when you talk about like retired um, officers who have come back and, and augmented uh, the force, what about like uh, uh, not just beat cops, but like detectives or other maybe former high ranking officers who have some of that, what do you call it, uh, institutional knowledge maybe to bring uh, to the table? Has that ever been kind of a... Talk about yeah, we, you know, I've actually talked to a couple of them and, uh, you know, some of them, uh, you know, do, do want to come back. Some of them do want to um, uh, contribute again to the department. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, sometimes we just talk about it and we never have a follow-up conversation uh, on it. But, you know, uh, uh, they're more than welcome, you know, uh, uh, come by, let, let's talk about it and see what we can do. Because, yeah, I mean, we, we, we appreciate all the help we can get. And, uh, you know, it's nice, you know, that uh, the retirees uh, still have their, their heart uh, in the Guam Police Department and, you know, their, their, their heart's in the right place. You know, they want to help the community. So we welcome that as well. Right on. Uh, Chief, you know, we are able to, uh, we're going to be debuting uh, next week the um, podcast that uh, you did with Sabrina. Uh, I don't want to give away too much of it, right? So th- we're, right. Sabrina's got this great podcast. Uh, it's called Crimes Without Convictions. And it's kind of a, a cold case. Um, podcast where she looks at a lot of uh, big cases in Guam's history where a conviction was not secured. Uh, that being said, Chief, uh, what is the, because it kind of got me thinking like the status of some of our, uh, and this case was not a cold case, right, because it did go through the court uh, system, but what is the status of like cold cases, not just the ones that we have uh, more recently, but in, in the past? How do you kind of determine what cases, if any, or I mean, is that even something that is part of your day to day? What cases can we take another look at or maybe reopen uh, to seek closure? Yeah, so, uh, you know, Chris, I remember again, going back through, through my experience uh, back in 2000, I was actually in charge of uh, the second uh, version or the second iteration of uh, the Unsolved Homicide Task Force. Uh, and one of the cases I actually worked on is that one I talked about where we went to Saipan to pick up um, an individual who was wanted for a murder in the 70s. Uh, so it was, you know, we were able to successfully close an unsolved homicide. But, you know, uh, unfortunately, the following year, you know, 9-11 occurred and uh, unsolved homicide teams just... Uh, so before 9-11, uh, unsolved homicide teams were actually uh, something that most uh, law enforcement agencies and... Um, even that the military law enforcement agencies are actually developed these teams. Yeah. Uh, I remember uh, there was a team from uh, Navy Criminal Investigation Service, NCIS. Um, they actually had an unsolved team come out to Guam because they actually have one unsolved homicide that occurred in a Navy base here in Guam. And so, uh, you know, we were coordinating some information and sharing with them. Uh, throughout the United States, there were a lot of uh, unsolved homicide teams that were being developed because, you know, uh, forensics has advanced, uh, you know, DNA has advanced to the point now where um, they're doing something, you know, very, very different called a familial DNA, you know, where you have this DNA database and if somebody closely related to the actual homicide suspect, this DNA gets put put in, you know, that, that database, you know, kind of tells the police department, uh, the, the detectives, hey, look, you know, uh, somebody related to this guy whose DNA you just put in, uh, somebody closely related to him uh, is matches the DNA from this unsolved homicide from many years ago. So I, there's at least two cases where I read a little bit about it in, uh, I think, San Francisco. Um, they, they actually solved a series of uh, unsolved homicides from a serial killer wow. based on familial DNA. So, uh, you know, 9-11 occurred. The, the unsolved homicide team just kind of went away. Uh, I think there was an attempt once uh, to bring it back, and uh, they did do some work on some of the cases. I'm not sure how far that went, but um, you know, uh, we, we we do that when you know when we have the personnel. And I love more than anything, I'd love to put an unsolved homicide team together. Uh, you know, that's where I think you know uh, those retired police officers who 
have intimate knowledge of these cases because they were around when they occurred, I think they would be of great uh, benefit to the department uh, in, in that respect. And I, I welcome that, you know, once we, hopefully, you know, once we get there uh, and, you know, we, we get enough people. But yeah, uh, unsolved homicide teams uh, do work. Uh, I've seen them work. I, I worked on a, a couple um, that, you know, uh, we close one or two, but, you know, the, unfortunately some of the others, we've worked on them for years. Uh, and uh, we, we just never got anywhere, you know, just not enough evidence or, you know, just we could, couldn't move forward. Right. Chief, just last question. So uh, it's resources, it's manpower to, to kind of re-stand up and unsolve the murder task force. But what about the, the evidence, the case files? Uh, in the event that we did do that or, or look at uh, any of these cold cases, are we positive that all of the relative uh, case data is still in a condition that we can work with? Uh, I'm sure they are. Uh, you know, we, we have an evidence control section and we have a, a evidence storage. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that's where, Chris, um, what, what's going to be beneficial uh, is when we get the DNA lab up and running. And so that's uh, about a year out. Uh, it's gonna open up, you know, uh, it's my understanding that we're probably gonna be finished with the building with this year. We'll be able to equip it, but by the time we, we get the, the personnel trained and to actually um, get them spun up to doing actual DNA analysis, uh, we're looking at maybe about a year, maybe a year and a half out. But at some point it will get done and we will get there and uh, we can actually start creating, uh, you know, possibly a DNA database so that uh, as things go along and we start to uh, collect DNA from uh, different uh, offenders that, you know, are required to submit DNA, uh, you know, who, who knows, we may get a break one of these days. Right on, Chief. Th thank you for your time. Very interesting uh, discussion this morning and I appreciate uh, you coming on. No problem. I'll see you guys uh, Friday at the swimming in. Make there sure you go. Okay, that's that. Thank you, uh, Chief Steve Ignacio. Uh, good news there. Takeaways are swearing in 21 uh, new police recruits on Friday, and then they're going to head out with their OJT, with their FTOs. Guys, that's police talk. Uh, they're on the job training with their field training officers. Right on. So the OJTs with the FTOs riding around with GPD. There you go. <laughs> and if you mess up, you go they're going to be on you ASAP. <laughs> And you don't want them to bust your ASS because <laughs> they are right. highly trained. All right. Thanks, Jay. Hey, uh, good morning, Guam. This is the link. It is 8 o'clock. Welcome back to The Link. It's 801. My name's Chris. I'm Jason. We have already had a really interesting show. Yeah. And, and I don't want to take anything away from, from the two interviews we've already had. Kathy Castro, the president of the Guam yep. Chamber of Commerce, was fantastic. Chief Steve Ignacio over at GPD. That was, was good stuff. Was, was very, very forthright. That was amazing. Good to see that there are going to be a lot more cops patrolling our streets and keeping each and every one of us safe. Right. We got good things coming up in the second half of the show, too. Uh, yeah, we do. You know, that was a, a really good talk with uh, Chief Ignacio there. Uh, I know everybody's into these uh, true crime podcasts, and I got to tell you, with the KUM Podcast Network, uh, we're going to debut a podcast series from our very own Sabrina Salas Mantanani. Uh, it's just going to knock your, it's going to knock your socks off guys. I mean, it is, it's so good. Uh, there's just a lot of crimes on Guam, uh, that have gone unsolved or, uh, where they went to court, they weren't able to secure a conviction. And, you know, like chief said, um, that was actually pretty newsworthy what he was talking about. Uh, I mean, we just ran the gamut from, the state of evidence in these cold case files to detectives who may have worked on these cold cases, possibly coming back to consult or otherwise help out with these cases. Should a unsolved uh, murder task force uh, be formed again? But you know, at the end of the day, it really comes down to su the support uh, the Guam police department gets from their oversight chair. Uh, who right now can't even really be the oversight chair because he's so conflicted uh, due to the actions of his family members. 
Um, so, yeah, it's rather unfortunate when you hear Chief talk about it comes down to the resources and the manpower because we're sitting on $600 million in federal American Rescue Plan funding. And so when you talk about resources, that's a hell of a lot of resources right there. Uh, could some of that go to the Guam Police Department to maybe do something like stand up an unsolved murder task force? Is there a desire to do that? It definitely sounds like the chief, uh, he spoke with conviction about uh, this issue. It definitely sounds like that's something he wants to do. Uh, but again, if uh, you're struggling to get enough officers out uh, to patrol the streets, then that kind of tells me that they don't have the personnel to, to even staff something like an unsolved crime task force. Cause that's going to take detectives away from working on whatever crimes are happening right now. Right. Um, but you know, we can't let the bad guys get away with it. It's kind of basic. So I just would love, uh, to see, uh, our Guam legislature and most especially our public safety, uh, public safety chair put their, um, money where the you know put their mouth where the money is whatever just give them money let's do this you know what i mean dna testing chief ignacio said that's about a year away that's going to be huge there's so many cases that you when i look back at like a lot of these cold cases unsolved murders you look at them and you think god if they'd only had the technology and you see it now a lot of these crime documentaries that's what's breaking so many of these cases open nationally and internationally is the um advent of technology and what they're able to do with dna testing and um just all kinds of and you know dna testing for forensics i think the chief kind of touched on it a little bit but that's really only been in wide practice since like the 80s right relatively speaking i mean since like the 80s fairly new thing yeah it's fairly new but i mean remember when that was the big discussion like time magazine had some oh dna dna is like the big thing it's going to change every aspect of life and yep so, I mean, we're going to be there. Bad guys, beware. We're going to get there. Uh, Tato 6, again, we're going to be streaming the uh, GHRA Economic Forum uh, coming up in minutes where the governor is anticipated to make a big announcement during her opening remarks. Uh, so that's coming up right now, though. Let's go ahead and get into the news with the very latest from the KUAM News team. The one and only. Ladies... It's Jason Solis. Good morning. Well, hang with us, everybody, because we are going to take you out to the Hyatt on Tumon Bay in about 15 minutes or so uh, for the governor's much-anticipated announcement. But for the time being, the Joint Information Center did report last night six new COVID-19 cases out of 363 samples tested on Tuesday. Four of your fellow Guamanians are currently hospitalized, three at GMH and one at Naval Hospital in Iganya Heights. There have been 8,310 officially reported cases 73 people are in active isolation and 8,098 have recovered from the disease. 90,998 island residents have been fully vaccinated, so that will pass in the 91,000 mark sometime today. And they have been vaccinated against coronavirus. The car score yesterday was 0.7. Today is 0.6. Nestor Lacanto is standing by in the newsroom, and he has your morning news link update. This news update is brought to you by Pacific Points. Do more, get more. This news update is brought to you by Pacific Points. Do more, get more. The grand prize winners in the second round of Governor Lou Leon Guerrero's Vaccine Win Incentive Program were announced a short while ago at Adeloup. KUAM's Adriana Cotero spoke to the lucky recipients of a brand new car and $10,000. Gov Guam is pushing to reach herd immunity or 96,000 of the island's population vaccinated by Liberation Day, which is July 21st. In order to ensure this, the governor is enticing the community with weekly grand prize giveaways. And I just want to thank um, the families that are here who have saw the importance of getting vaccinated and really got vaccinated, not because they wanted to win something, but because they wanted to win something for their family in terms of their protection, their safety, and the safety of our community. Um, But 
They did enter and they did win. The exciting announcement was made by Governor Lou Leon Guerrero and Lieutenant Governor Joshua Tenorio on Wednesday afternoon. Taking home a new 2021 Nissan Versa SR was 74-year-old Jose Ampinko. He received his first Moderna dose on January 13th and his second dose on February 10th. I feel great, but this is the first time I ever win a prize. You don't know when you're going to win. Might as well register now because just like, like, like I said, I never win anything. So as soon as my wife registered me, I was surprised when Crystal called me up this morning and says, are you for real? He says, yes, sir. So, you know, I recommend everybody should register and get their vaccine out. And the $10,000 cash prize goes to Petronello Rodrin, who just celebrated his 71st birthday earlier this month on June 8th. Speaking on behalf of Rodrin was his son, Aaron Rodrin. This morning I told him he won this, the prizes, but we don't know yet which one is... We, if the car is the 10,000, but he's very happy. Rodrin received his first shot of the Moderna vaccine on January 12th and his second dose on February 10th. If we're vaccinated all, it's helped to, not to spread the virus. Thus far, 90,933 island residents are fully immunized, with 51,535 individuals signed up for the program. There is still a chance to enter. All you have to do is get vaccinated, then register on the GVB website. That's visitguam.com backslash vax. Winners are chosen every Wednesday until July 21st. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Adriana Cotero. You may need to get a COVID shot to work at the Department of Corrections. Prison management is working on a policy to require employees to get vaccinated. Here's Tyler Matanani with a story. 72% of the inmate population at the Department of Corrections is vaccinated against COVID, while the vaccination rate for employees is 10% less. DOC spokesman Major Anton Uggin says that while they're encouraging both inmates and employees to get their shots, they're also working on a policy that will mandate it for DOC employees. I'm of the impression that we can order our employees based on my research that this is a public health issue and the nature of our job that we can actually, we should be, we should be requiring our employees to get vaccinated. We're just trying to encourage them right now, but I'll tell you right now, in the next few weeks, we're probably going to put out an order where we're going to have to order them to get vaccinated. Okay. Unless they have medical or uh, religious issues. And as long as nothing is violating the American Disabilities Act, he says they should get the green light. DOC has been in communication with the Attorney General's office to work out the legalities. The government needs to really look at it. I think the governor and her legal team and the AG should be, right now, at least exploring it. What are the options about having an organization or even the government forcing their employees? You know, Saipan did that and, and seven of their firefighters lost their job. Again, said that based on his research of how other states are handling vaccines and employees, the main question being asked is how far can an organization order their employees to get vaccinated? In the end, he says the government has an obligation to protect their workers. If you're an employee here at this department, we have an obligation to provide you a safe working environment. And if that's from a contagious disease like COVID, then we as a department should do what we can to protect you and your family, you know, when you come to work here. He adds that the nature of the job makes it difficult to maintain social distancing and that the inmates are under government care and they have the responsibility to make sure they're safe. If that other virus gets here and starts really spreading, we're going to be in trouble, you know, and we're not sure if Uncle Sam's going to let us out this time. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Tyler Matsunani. And COVID-19 vaccinations and testing resumed today at the Dededo Farmers Co-op. They were canceled Tuesday due to inclement weather. KUAM's Isaiah Uggins stopped by the clinic. Shadia Constantine is a physician working on Guam, but is also a wife and mother to three boys. She shares that her family was brought to Guam to get immunized against the coronavirus. My family live in Japan. Um, they are all Americans. Um, I got vaccinated earlier on. So because the rollout in Japan is being so, so slow, I brought them here to get vaccinated. So my husband and my 13-year-old just got the vaccine. Thanks to Guam. Thank you. Her son, Roman Constantine, received the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. He shared what made him roll up his sleeve. Because I'm 13 and I want to be cured of the coronavirus. I don't see why you need to be scared. I, I'm, I mean, like, the vaccine is good. 
Shadia's husband, 40-year-old Jonathan Constantine, and 70-year-old Daisy McAwellung of Manilao shared why they got vaccinated against COVID-19. I want to contribute to getting rid of this uh, pandemic. You know, I want to be one of the people getting it cleared and hopefully uh, telling more people about it so that everybody gets it. Because we're planning to go f to mainland for family reunion. So I want to make sure that we got everything before we leave. Despite the rainy weather earlier in the week, the COVID-19 combination clinic spearheaded by the Department of Public Health and Social Services and the Guam National Guard went well. Medical Task Force Acting Commander Major Roseanne Aperon said after an hour of operations, about 70 doses of the COVID vaccines were administered. She says those who showed up to get vaccinated share that they are looking forward to winning something from the Vax to Win incentive program. Mostly for their, their, their health and their safety for that of them, themselves and their family members. Uh, they also come through, uh, some of them have heard of the Vax and uh, the, the raffle drawing that we have uh, going on in the government. Uh, as a good incentive. By the end of the day, 100 doses of the COVID vaccine were administered. As far as COVID testing, DPHSS Nursing Resource Command Margarita Bautista Gay said testing was slow Wednesday morning compared to last week where 100 samples were tested. So we, we just had one with a loss of taste and smell, uh, coughing, slight fever, sore throat, uh, runny nose. Those are common symptoms for flu. But because of COVID, they're scared that it might be COVID. Okay. So they're, ju they're just making sure that they're safe. She also shared that 60 people were tested with 90 specimens collected today at the clinic. Reporting for Guam's News Network, Guahu C. Isaiah Uggen. The 20 positive COVID-19 cases reported recently were a result of family exposure, with a majority of them not vaccinated. Acting Public Health Medical Officer Chima Mwakwan says they were identified through contact tracing. Of the 20 positives, 15 had not gotten their COVID shots yet, and three were not eligible. Despite the rise in positive cases, Mbakwan says for now, there's nothing to worry about. All of them were true case investigation. So we had uh, index cases. The team went out and um, conducted interviews, were able to identify their contacts, and then they were tested and they were all positive. So I think um, we don't really have to lose too much sleep because uh, it's contained now. As well, the majority of the positive individuals were symptomatic and that's what da what's dangerous, explains Mbakwan. Now, even when you do the temperature checks, um, when you're going into buildings, you, you, you seem to understand that you can't even detect these people who are positive. So it is a, is a, is a huge balance between you know, personal responsibility, you, know, you wearing your mask to protect yourself as against hoping that the temperature checks at the door would catch someone who is sick. But at this point, we're looking at, we're seeing more asymptomatic people walking around with the virus. Mbakum says wearing the mask is a form of intervention for individual protection, whether vaccinated or not. In other news, more tangible evidence of how federal assistance has helped prop up the economy. The government's total revenue collections have surpassed projections. Through the month of May, GovGuam took in some $6.4 million more than expected. According to the latest Consolidated Revenue and Expenditure Report, which tracks the government's budget, as of May, GovGuam collected some $558 million in general fund revenues compared to its projected $551.8 million. Budget Director Lester Carlson says the big boost came from income taxes as the filing deadline was pushed back to May. You see like individual, you know, we collected $22 million more, uh, corporate 2.8 more, withholding 2.8 more. We did um, collect $6.4 million more total than what we anticipated. Um, if it, and then you take that number um, and you project forward all things being equal, um, you know, we're still looking at um, exceeding the adopted level by $6.4 million. That's the good news. Not so good is the fact that come September, most direct federal assistance will end and the unemployed and underemployed, says Carlson, need to find work to keep the economy from sputtering. I'm really hoping though, Esther, that people um, take heed of the fact that yes, 
there's been a lot of federal dollars in for people that uh, were displaced um, due to the pandemic. But there's a, everybody's looking for work. For, for employees these days, everybody. That and an uptick in tourism through the Airbnb program, he says, will sustain government revenues. I'm very optimistic that the uh, the tracking of the BPT, you know, will, will you know, uh, kind of catch up, especially when we are able to host more guests and those guests spend more money. But with further federal help uncertain, the fiscal year 2022 budget will likely be a different matter. The governor still has some $600 million at her disposal, but while senators have been urging Adloop to release a spending plan, Carlson says they won't until the Treasury releases the final spending rules in July. By the time the legislature gets ready to um, sit down formally, we'll also have the information to be able to provide, and I think collectively, you know, we should be able to to do some things. The legislature has until the end of August to pass a final budget. After a new dengue fever case was confirmed on Wednesday, public health urges residents to continue prevention measures, especially during the rainy weather. The island hasn't had a dengue case since February of 2020, but on Monday, public health received laboratory-confirmed diagnosis. Dengue fever is a mosquito-borne tropical disease caused by the dengue virus. However, it's not contagious and can't be spread from person to person. Public Health Information Officer Janela Carrera said it's such a coincidence this happened now because it's National Mosquito Control Awareness Week. Now is a great time to really exercise, you know, these, these tips. Um, if you have any flower pots, you know, the, the base of the flower pots, sometimes the the uh, water tends to collect around that area. Make sure you constantly check and throw it out. Um, if you have old tires that are, you know, hanging uh, just around your yard, um, make sure you throw out the water that tends to pond at the bottom uh, part of it. Um, you know, the, the back side of your house or the sides of your house where there's um, the drip from your air conditioning, um, make sure it's not collecting in certain areas. The case is a resident of Dededo and Public Health is continuing surveillance of the area to further prevent the spread. This news update is brought to you by Pacific Points. Do more, get more. And with an update in our native tongue, here's Uncle King Conception with your Chamorro News Update, sponsored by First Hawaiian Bank. When it's an update to get some to be the Chamorro in the KUAM News. For the center, your family and me to give First Hawaiian Bank. Para mga sentensya si Lawrence Vincent C. Fergerger, gi September yan at miti na umisawi no manataka ang 4 anos na pagpampalawan gi mga pasasakan. Ang sunay nataka sa sumana intensyon na ni para Committee Criminal Sexual Conduct gi ipatgan. Iwasan ng Henerada Bagao, masangan na i-biktima dyan si Nananya at hindi sinipotin ni Victim sa Vikian Oficina sa Manapan ng Badga. Tapos ay sumama na informasyon ni tinagogong niya muna ikaw sa Fikurger. Mas ang konsidera ay finunia, gidesisyon ni Kotti para i-plea agreement na kinimbikta yung lugar di masigon muna para i-trial. I-prosecutor sa MSPP at mas 14 na sinintensya no sinedi ni i-plea agreement no para 4 anos gi i-preso. I-hearing para sinintensya sa idea 24 gi September. Mas asunto, Ma report ni Public Health na Guaha makonfirma na kausan dengue fever gi sa Guahan. Gi Nero sa Febrero na mes gi mapos sa Sakan na ato na ahen siya maresibi dos na kausa ni makonfirma. Antes di ato gi dos mid disinwebi na Sakan, hato tad menti dos na kausa po todo. Ilingya Public Health na sinya madeklara outbreak kumuha tisa gwi maninaji gwi ni gi tres pat mas gi dos semana na tempo. I dengue fever sa ni natat kilo kalenturamu, forti na malinik ulo, Mamuti ta tinatadog mo, mamuti ko dyan tira mo, mamuti gagat mo dyan itatlang mo, manroon sa saw, dyan mahagay gweng mo dyan itamugam. Mabibisoy publiko na makonsigi na tahan este na tsetnod, dyan hokay basula gyuri dyan guma, dyan nagas ka sa saganhan mo gisan itong igima, dyan otosia na fordgo na lugar na manbrubaday na amusia. Masa tikulo, Mafit many Guam Housing and Urban Renewal Authority pat gura as a memorandum of understanding the Guam Homeless Coalition ni para managwa o santay size na Section 8 emergency housing vouchers para di siya mangkwalifika na managima na familia pat persona siya. I voucher siya sa man mapremio i gura ni U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. I kunalifika sa itautaw siya pat familia ni taza lugar na po fanyaga ang buwengi i mafalagugo si empitisugi familia empitun na ginatsungi i natangkan bas ni i man matatitis di zaman maaadu i trafikasyon tautaw at si man naigima na tautaw. 
Zanati siya kung muman ma-assisti ti lusot tungo sa fanay gima. Islapi pares ti sa idea uno gihulio na uparugwaha. Loy guam hongles coalition sa man masedi no igura para matutuhon man ma-referi yung sigidas. Yot tumo, gipangin matis man nagwaha public hearing para di Bill 112 at yun na legislasyon sa ma-proposyon para ma-ago di tres na tautaw gi arbitration panel at sedi dot the magistrates guini para konsidera gi konfiyansa na manera klama siha ang siyano na testimonyo so ma identifica as the clamacia ni Artemus as the loki as the alternative confidential arbitration pero na conforma ni kinensente ni dos partida he bill one one two sa aplica gwi para di man profesional na man nahum lu na tautaw gwi no kinubri ni medical malpractice mandatory arbitration act i legislasyon sa aplica ma prapraktika na reglamento man man assisti za konsigi aplikasyon ni government claims act for government providers Gua pedretusyon siya mapit makarta para sa senador siya no masangan na masesang kontra este na legislasyon saan para u ma-repeal pat manakritiraw di Mandatory Arbitration Act. Lengya na masenhonggi na este na beo sa negatibo da siya sempili gru para di edmas manisisita siya na tautawi ifa maguon. Sa potpiretusyon siya matungo na sen nata yun ang system pediatric guinigi islata di sa timali tinagogong niya sa putinahong specialist pediatric I Bill 112-36 ay na mas baba ay sitwasyon. Mas hearing para isti na Bill sa pumasusedi gi dia syati zani dia dosi gi hulio. Para Guam News Network, Guam si Ken Conception. Yasunto gi finu tsamoro sa pendisenta zani na fatu ni familia Mizu gi First Hawaiian Bank. One we need today more than ever. And with the new First Hawaiian Bank mobile app, you can stay just as connected to your finances. And it all starts with yes. All right, everybody, as promised, we are going to take you live now via Zoom to the Hyatt Regency Guam on beautiful Tumon Bay for the much-anticipated economic forum as Governor Lulian Gro is getting ready to take the stage and make what is expected to be a very very big announcement so once again we are taking you live there via zoom um, it's being brought to you by the guam chamber of commerce as well as uh several of the chambers of commerce the women's chamber of commerce also the guam hotel and restaurant association uh we will be taking you there momentarily uh kathy castro who we interviewed the, of course the president of the um, guam chamber of commerce was talking to us about some of the impacts on um business and what's expected to come in the next few months as guam still is in recovery mode and remember she said she doesn't see us being in a normal operational tempo for several months now it is expected that the governor will touch on that um talking about uh again she has been targeting uh and she has been uh giving her charges to the businesses of guam to say let's get ready because on liberation day like probably our most cherished holiday here on the island uh that will be the day when we can reopen tourism. So now let's go live to the Hyatt on Tumon Bay for the Economic Forum. Health and safety, which is very important to all of us. Uh, we have some information to share with you. And first and foremost, we'd really like to give special thanks to the Department of Health and Social Services Division of Environmental Health for working with Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association and the Hyatt Regency Guam on the health and safety protocols and the guidance for this conference and the forum today. Some other items, breakfast is available outside in the foyer and a to-go lunch will be provided to all attendees at this at the end of the forum. Restrooms are to the right of the ballroom, the forum area. Uh, we ask that you please follow all health and safety protocols by wearing a mask at all times and maintaining social distancing and as much distancing as possible. Uh, we want you to know that all microphones will be sanitized between the speakers and as you see on the stage too, uh, there will be social distancing for the panelists. Attendees will be able to ask questions either in the ballroom or live on the webinar chat at the end of each panel, should time allow. Please know that we may not be able to get to all of the questions depending on time, so we ask for your understanding and patience as we get through them. This forum, is live on Zoom and will be recorded. The Economic Forum is also being streamed live on 
to Guam Hotel Restaurant Association's Facebook page as well as AUAM. Sponsor organizations will also upload the form after the event and it will be shared with its members. And some will be uploaded into the respective websites for the organizations and will be available on YouTube channels. As part of today's events, there's a QR code and for some of you who have availed of that, the QR code today was provided and it will be part of a live demonstration later on in one of our panels. Please know that this demo that you will see with the QR code is going to be a proof of concept and we'll share more information with you today about that. As the panels come up, we will explain the format of the panel. And we will also go over some of the housekeeping rules, again, with the panels as we proceed. Throughout this public health pandemic, we have been challenged in many ways beyond any of our programmed decision-making processes or systems. During this pandemic, leadership became a necessity on many fronts. And there is one individual who can share more stories than anyone in this room. And I hope that she kept the journal because I'd love to read about her leadership experiences during this historical period. That isn't over yet, and is why we are here, to continue the path forward for our island's recovery efforts together. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Governor Lou Leon Guerrero, Imada Hagen Warman, to give her welcoming remarks. Thank you very much, Dr. Lynette. I just want to say good morning. Why are you guys in the next time? Good morning. Oh, good day. 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 Right. I just want to thank you, Charlie, for putting this up and I'm together. And I just want to thank them for the opportunity for us to uh, share some remarks and discussions among ourselves so we can move on with uh, reopening our app. A year ago today, I would have reported that our future was looking incredibly bright. Tourism numbers were approaching 2 million, the military buildup was moving forward, employment grew 4.3% uh, in 2018. Our people were at work. Cash reserves were up, and receiverships were disappearing. Instead, I was faced with the most awful, scary, painful, and difficult decision, knowing that a pandemic was in sight. When FEMA first analyzed the potential force of this unprecedented pandemic on our island, their models projected we could lose up to 3,000 lives if we could not intervene. Guided by science, guided by my physician's advice to me, and guided by my experience as a registered nurse, we implemented policies to protect our people. As a territory lacking the authority to close our Guam International Airport, we established the first mandatory quarantine for foreign travelers. To contain the spread, we enforced a mask mandate and I also made a painful decision to close non essential businesses to save my life. As an island, we endured not one, but two stretches. In our dark hours, we reported 102 COVID hospitalization admissions. We mourned multiple COVID deaths a day 
and we aim on traveling nurses to support our local health care cure. Acting quickly, we changed our course by expanding our ability to test, track, and treat new cases. We also empowered our community with information to understand our level of risk. The COVID area risk score, or CAR score, takes into account our incidents of new cases. How well testing identifies those patients and at our worst, we reported a CAR score of 47. Today, we maintain a CAR score well under one. With stable numbers and more residents protected by the vaccine, I felt confident lifting additional restrictions. Now, families and friends gather in groups of up to 100 people. Restaurants, retail, and bars operate at up to 75% occupancy. Travelers who have been, who've been at vaccinated enter our borders without quarantine. Unvaccinated travelers with negative results and arrival now quarantine at home. And just last week, we approved our standard operating procedures for our Airbnb program to include both U.S. expatriates and non-U.S. citizens, marking the beginning of the return of tourists to our island. Here, the growing list of local businesses approved for Guam Safe Certification and the WPC Safe Travel Staff Program, as well as the recent launch of the Guam Electronic Declaration Forum, we are really confident that Guam is a safe destination. While we begin to safely welcome visitors to our island, we continue our aggressive efforts towards Operation Liberate Guam. Our initiative to vaccinate 80% of our adult population by Guam's Liberation Day on July 21st. As of today, we have nearly 91,000 fully vaccinated persons on Guam. Of that, over 86,000 are 18 and over. That means nearly 72 percent of our adult population has the full protection. And this brings us closer to the great Guam from the of this deadly virus. And with more residents protected by the vaccine, we've made great strides to shift from COVID response to now recovery. My physician's advisory group has recommended that when we achieve 75% of vaccinated adults, that we should lift additional travel restrictions. I will bring this to my team for further discussion. And I want to assure you that we are methodically reopening our island. My vision for Guam after July 21st is to get back to normal as possible. While I will still encourage residents to wear their face masks, especially crowds, I intend to restore occupancy occupants limits to 100% and lift the cap on social gatherings. While we work together to navigate the new normal, know that I have instructed public health to stay the course, to continue to test, track, and treat all new COVID test cases. I recognize that public health emergency does not end on July 21st. We must stay vigilant. This pandemic remains a fluid situation especially with the threat of the new variant. While we have focused on the health of our people, we also provided support to those in need. We created local programs and administered federal ones to provide emergency relief to businesses in our most vulnerable, having paid over $1.2 billion that went right back into our economy. As we restore our economy, more people will be able to get back to work. 
While Guam did not have an unemployment program prior to the pandemic, Dave Gilsola and his team stood right up in a matter of weeks, infusing $724 million back into our economy and keeping our businesses afloat. In addition to that, over $442 million in economic impact gains. Five million for small business pandemic and rental assistance. Over 16 million for families for Programa Selecti. And 1.4 million to landlords for emergency rental assistance for further needs in our economy. The assistance with which my administration has provided to me will go a long way as this injection of needed financial stimulus will provide means to move our island people. And we're providing them with the needed tools to stay resilient and to start future prosperity as we look on to bring Guam back to new economic heights. Here in the present day, unemployment is sitting just over 15%, which is about 10% higher than before the pandemic. We have something my economic advisors call cyclical unemployment to describe those who were unemployed not due to the pandemic but other limitations such as health, child care, and so forth. While well, assisting this population is an ongoing need of most communities here in Guam, the most acute need is our population now who were furloughed due to the pandemic environment. Most especially those who work in our tourism industry, roughly 6,500 people as of March 2021. The Small Business Pandemic Grant launched in 2020 by the Guam Economic Development Authority gathered data, and most sobering was that over 2,000 businesses experienced an average drop of 74 to 88 percent in revenue in the second quarter of 2020, due to the halting of our tourism and our closing our borders. Anticipating this drop, we mobilized 17 million in CARES Act funding to distribute to small businesses who suffered at least 25% interruption and were able to help 2,352 businesses keep their doors open. Federal programs like the PPP and the PIBL help right around the same number of businesses. We ask banks to consider using the State Small Business Credit Initiative loan program through VITA to refinance debt and defer payments for six months or more. We were on our way to welcome visitors back to shore. Then a second wave hit. Realizing that this played an added strain on the operations of our service and retail industry, we quickly stood up a small business rent assistance grant program. We distributed over 400 checks and options to $3 million. While most states and territories rely solely on the Paycheck Protection Program and the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, we established our own local grants to extend assistance to our business. Other territories, including Puerto Rico and the Northern Mariana, started up in some grant banks at the territorial, lo territorial level, but we continue to offer the most. I stand legislation to lift the base on this exemption so that more small businesses would pay less in GCP. I raised convenience fees and I directed revenue and taxes to accept payment plans. And yes, our individual stimulus programs help our people meet their needs and advance their money into our local business. This is our problem, a good problem. Inventory was lined up to go. You couldn't find a bicycle and turn it. 
We count as some of our relationships are accounts of relationship short. People went realizing the need for industry diversification. I ask our own agency, such as the Department of Agriculture, and even our village mayor to take part in getting law working. Many answers to call. The nonprofit program received funding from the administration of Native Americans to instigate businesses at all. Law makers, cooking, are a cottage industry. Farmers of the Kowash who lost hotel business came together to provide produce bags to the community through agriculture. The need to diversify our economy is nothing new, and at the outset of my administration, I established an agriculture task force. The U.S. Economic Development Administration has poured money onto understanding and making efficient our commercial agriculture industry. Our local hatchery is selling 1,000 pounds of food per month. And it is very delicious. Additionally, with the help of the Chamber of Commerce, we brought together my economic working group recommending multiple things, including expanding construction, manufacturing pharmaceuticals, ship repair, technology, and others. Many of you in attendance here today volunteer on this working group, and I thank you for your contribution. Your feedback and insight has been invaluable. One thing I know is that our business here are resilient. Prior to the pandemic, we experienced the collapse of the yen in the United States. Here is the super typhoon, SARS, and even the threat of North Korea. Our community is like a triage in the emergency room. We are responsive. We adapt well to stressful situations and we get the work done. In the immediate future, I plan to use American Rescue Plan money to offer another round of small business grants. While the clock is ticking on Kukua, my administration is preparing an initiative to transition the unemployed to employed. But I need you to partner with me. We are working to incentivize the return to work so that you can be more aggressive in your hiring. The concept is this it is designed to subsidize your new hire for two months so that you can get back on your feet. This way, we help businesses and get people working. Stay tuned for days. In summary, we are offering direct aid to small business, stimulus for families to spend in our economy, and continued policy work to create a more business friendly environment. I know you don't always agree, but I hope you realize we are all in this together and we are on the same team. In the words of Bruno Mars, I'm going to leave the door open to tell me that you're coming through. To do a spot you and keep it going. And once again, you are looking live at the Economic Forum at the High Regency Guam over on Tuman Bay. That was our island's Magahaga, Governor Lou Leon Grill. Um, giving what was essentially and primarily an overview of some of the the programs, the services, the infrastructure, um, and the assistance uh, that her administration has basically stood up to give to residents just like you and me, as well as to many of the businesses there. Um, many, I could see when they went to a shot of the crowd, uh, many are members of the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce, the Chinese Chamber of Commerce, the Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association, decision makers, executives, people at that level, um, wanting insight, wanting uh, perspectives and, and forecasts about what could come in the next four months. And remember when we had Kathy Castro, the president of the Guam Chamber of Commerce earlier this morning right here on the link, she was saying, you know, we're in recovery mode right now. We are still nowhere near what could be um, 
considered a normal way of life. But that was interesting because Governor Leon Grill, let me see uh, some real quick notes. Um, she is saying that she does plan to methodically open our island, still using a phased approach, uh, very iterative going over this. Um, she opened by basically saying um, she feels confident lifting additional restrictions. She also indicated that as we move closer and closer to the stated goal of July 1st, of course, being Liberation Day of Guam's most uh, revered holiday, the day that we were um, liberated from Japanese occupation on July 21st back in 1944. Um, that is the goal that she set, and uh, hopefully if we get to herd immunity by then, uh, she, will, she did say that she is considering lifting the cap on social gatherings. Um, of course, right now, generally speaking, in restaurants, and um, that's about 75% capacity. Uh, I believe bars are still at about half. Um, as far as the numbers right now, she was saying 70% um, of the adult population has been inoculated at this point. So adult population, um, remember the uh, amount of young people that are now beginning, beginning to uh, receive the vaccine. Uh, just a few weeks ago, it was allowed that people 16 years and that demographic uh, could receive their vaccination shots as well. So 70% of Guam's adult population, roughly about that number, has now been fully inoculated uh, as per the advice of the Physicians Advisory Group, once Guam does hit the 75% mark, uh, the governor will lift travel additional travel restrictions, and she does plan once again to lift the cap on social gatherings. Uh, we told you at the top of the show, about 91,000 people have been fully vaccinated. That does include adults um, and younger people. So we are going to have a lot of this. We've got at least two people covering this right now. We've got people watching this on Zoom. We're also going to have... Um, some people down there will get some face-to-face -face reactions. Uh, we do want to tell you, if you do want to watch this very, very riveting stuff, if you want to see what the future of the Guam economy would be uh, and the much-anticipated return of tourism, of course, our number one economic driver, go to ghra.org. If you would like to directly jump in the webinar and have an interactive session, you can join their Zoom webinar. If you just like to watch, you can go on Facebook because the Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association's page as well as the Guam Chamber of Commerce's page are streaming today's economic forum. Um, I just want to give you a real quick uh, advisory on some of the speakers that we'll be presenting. Um, you just heard from the governor, of course. Vaccine tourism is up now, and I've still got it here on my screen, and they're preparing for that uh, presentation. That's going to be given by Public Health, uh, GVB, and a host of other uh, organizations. That's vaccine tourism. That goes for about a half hour. Um, the essential tools presentation will cover the uh, very popular Guam at Safe Certified program. There are over 100 local businesses that have now uh, been vetted as Safe Certified. We have a segment right here on KUM every Monday where we feature um, those companies. So that's going to be at 1015 at 1045. The QR code program, I know a lot of people have been DMing us asking what is going on with that. When is it supposed to be? It was supposed to have launched. They were projecting uh, maybe about two weeks ago. But the QR um, code program, the presentation of that is at 1045. And then uh, at 11.15, some of the scholars over at the University of Guam will be revealing uh, some of the studies that they did into COVID-19 and its impacts on both the private uh, and public sector. So there is a lot of information to take in, a lot of really good stuff. Um, so we invite you to check that out over on GHRA or the Guam Chamber of Commerce's Facebook page. As for us, we're going to take a break. We're going to get situated with our Zoom call right now, and we're going to see if... Chris is reading to kids over in Laddie Heights. He's at Atacau Elementary School, and he is standing by. we got some good stuff coming up, so please stay with us right here on The Link. KUAM News, in partnership with the Guam Visitors Bureau, brings you the Guam Safe and WTTC Safe Travel Certified Program Showcase. Look out for this powerful symbol for visitors, island residents, and industry workers alike, as it represents establishments with a consistent global commitment to safety practices. Stamped with approval by the Guam Visitors Bureau and the World Travel Tourism Council. Every Monday on KUAM News, we'll feature a different local business who's taken the Safe Guam and Safe Travels pledge to maintain health and safety standards to get Guam back on track. Log on to visitguam.com to see how your business can receive the designation, what businesses in our community are Guam Safe Certified, and have the WTTC Safe Travel Certified. Uno Go, delivering meals from your favorite restaurants and more, including delivering sodas and adult beverages from the Bottle Shack. Visit uno-go.com or download the app today. Also, follow them on Instagram and Facebook. 
KUAM's multi-platform morning show, The Link, just got a little more delicious with Feed Me Fridays. Chris, Sabrina, Jason, and the rest of the morning crew will take some time each Friday to talk food, taste food, and bring you all the latest and greatest in food from King's Restaurants and Ruby Tuesday Guam. Old faves, new hits, and everything on the menu in between. It's Feed Me Fridays on The Link. June makes the best malasadas in Hawaii, a fact not lost on Daryl, whose brother Byron is cooking the onaga he caught at a secret fishing spot with his girlfriend Malia, who used to work for the Shave Ice Guy, whose second cousin Vince drives the school bus ridden by Kalei, whose auntie makes the best malasadas in Hawaii. Everything here is connected, and with the new First Hawaiian Bank mobile app, you can stay just as connected to your finances, and it all starts with yes. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. Do you feel like you're missing out on something? Make life more rewarding with Pacific Point. Earn and redeem points for bill rebates and preload at IT&E, discounts on fuel at Shell, vouchers at Foodies, and United Mileage Plus Miles. You can even pay with Pacific Points at IT&E, Shell, and Foodies. Pacific Points. Do more. Get more. The relationship between Guam and Manila, Philippines is undeniable as we share similar cultural traditions, history, and heritage with generations of Filipinos calling Guam home. KUAM presents a monthly look at the capital city featuring in-depth and engaging interviews on everything from medical tourism to new business and government leaders. Veteran newscaster Nestor Lecanto delivers Beyond Our Borders. This special program is brought to you by the Bank of Guam and KFC. Our World War II survivors have endured more sacrifice, suffering, fear, hope, and perseverance than we can ever imagine. Their stories have been passed down from generation to generation and have become a central part of the legacies and histories of our families. As we commemorate our 77th annual liberation, we invite you to share these stories and special memories as we present My Liberation Hero. During the month of July, KUAM will feature these tributes on KUAM News as well as on our digital platforms. We ask that you start your video or written submissions with the phrase, My Liberation Hero Is, and please submit pictures of your heroes if you have them. Send your emails to liberation at KUAM.com and let's give everyone a chance to reflect and remember these special times and people in our history. Happy 77th Liberation Day, Guam. Brought to you by Coast 360 Federal Credit Union, Ordot Dental Clinic, and Vince Jewelers. After a year with so many games and events delayed or unplayed, the world is ready for anything and everything in the world of sports. KUAM Communications is ready with more games, more championships, and more specials that are guaranteed to bring out the fan in you. Don't miss a minute of gameplay from NBC on KUAM TV 8 or from CBS on KUAM TV 11. Every month, we'll bring you the action and excitement. Brought to you locally by Michelob Ultra, Superior Light Beer, Marianas Irrigation and Landscape, and Docomo Pacific. Just more great reasons to tune in and turn on so you'll fall in love with TV again with the best from KUAM Communications. Catch SportsLink on the KUAM News Morning Show, The Link, every Friday to hear about the latest in sports news, game schedules, athlete profiles, and more. SportsLink, brought to you each week by Cure Alkaline Water and Mariana's Irrigation and Landscape, airs every Friday across the multimedia platforms of KUAM. Tune into the broadcast on Breeze 93.9 FM on KUAM TV 11, live streaming through the KUAM News Facebook page, or view highlights on YouTube, KUAM News Facebook, and Instagram. SportsLink is hosted by Dave Delgado through KUAM Sports, and he will make sure that everyone knows what is happening on the fields, in the gyms, and everywhere in between. 
ekongok ega dan eja kifinu samoru gesun tun samoru kada dia gi KUAM news gacha gi i the link na programa gi los otsu ge egan gi esla samoru streaming radio peri KUAM news youtube na channel para lina bianu facilidad mizu malata fanita para mas informasyon metros sa diligencia ni sem preciosa na kulturata entri sesu tana sebi kada dia e lingua hina tibu ni i samoru yesun tu gifinu samoru sa ni na fafatu dan pena linunuzi ni i familia mizu gi i first hawaiian bank coming back so the mail man everybody uh lots of really interesting comments uh feedback responses of course like a fair bit of uh concern about some of the governor's um comments uh Nestor Lacanto is covering this for us he is on site right now and uh Adeloupe was gracious enough to give us a comment of the remarks so Nestor's kind of parsing through that what's interesting is he's putting in our group chat um three month subsidy uh did the governor announce to businesses for employee hiring that is going to be something that's interesting so he's going to look into that uh for you once again the economic forum ongoing right now at the Hyatt on, on Tumon Bay. A lot of the uh, big minds in across industry, you know, as you would expect in business, primarily with hospitality for all hoteliers and restaurateurs. Uh, they are down there. We saw met several members of the retail sector, several service industries, obviously tour companies who are um, directly affected by uh, the downturn in tourism. Um, so please check that out. That is on GHRA's. Uh, Facebook page, Guam Hotel Re and Restaurant Association. Well, as promised, we are waiting on Chris Barnett, who is up at Laddie Heights at Atacau Elementary School. He is reading to kids today. Uh, but before we get to that, we want to give you a sneak peek and a little bit of a teaser at the new podcast we've got coming up on the KOM Podcast Network. It is called Hafa Day Zu. It is hosted by Josh St. Augustine and our friend Glenn Lujan. So here is this week's Profiles and Pride with Josh and Glenn. <laughs> Buenas and half a day. My name is F. Glenn Lujan. And I'm Joshua San Augustine. We are the hosts of KUAM's podcast network. Um, we'll be coming up with uh, our own show called 
half a day to do it. Basically, we're going to be just discussing um, all things related to our LGBTQ community and just um, shed some light on who we are and what we do and you know we're, we're just everyday people in, in on Guam. And we got a lot of interesting topics coming up too so please stay tuned because it's gonna get juicy. Very juicy. <laughs> <laughs> so like growing up I guess for me when I knew the difference between male and female I knew what I was attracted to already. I think I was like four or five years old at the time and then I didn't start to act on that maybe until I was like 16 or 17 years old. I had my first, my first boyfriend. One of my siblings and I got into a huge argument and the sibling and I was like, I'm gonna go and tell mom you have a boyfriend. Said sibling comes around the corner and says, mom, did you know Joshua has a boyfriend? And I'm like, my mom turns around, she goes, do you have a boyfriend? And I was like, I do. And that was it. I mean, thankfully though, you know, my mom did have a gay brother, so we had a gay uncle growing up, and they were already exposed to that early on. But it was a little harder for him, and so I guess for me, my mom tried to make it a little easier when I when I kind of came out. So for me, my coming out story, um, you know, I, I knew I knew from the get go in my teens, I was a little bit there's something different about me, the way I'm feeling and everything. And there was one night here at the house, my mom was in her room, and. You know, I just felt that I felt the need to, to tell her, you know, um, I go, mom, there's something I need to tell you. And, you know, of course, my mom's response is what? And I was just really quiet. I was nervous. I was fidgeting. And, you know, she's just sitting there, you know, she's watching TV. And I go, mom, um, I need to tell you something. And she goes, what? Just tell me, spit it out. And I'm like, um, mom, you know, I just took a deep breath and I said, mom, I'm, I'm gay. And then my mom just, uh, she stopped, she stopped looking at the TV, she turned towards me. And you know, she just said, I day boy, what, what am I gonna do? You know, God, God created you this way and you're my son and I love you no matter what. You know, matter, you know, matter what, who you love and for who you are. So don't, don't worry about it, you know, everything's gonna be okay. And I was bawling, I was crying and you know, I, I took it. I was, you know, being so dramatic and she's even like, why are you crying? I said, oh, because, you know, it's so emotional, mom. And she goes, Aire, she goes, you're, you're okay, you know, God loves you, I love you. And, and that's all that matters, so, Aire, and then she, she, she goes, no wonder why, I'm always wondering why you keep going out every night, every night. I'm like, oh, that's what it is? I go, yeah, mom. And she goes, Aire, I thought you're doing something else. Duru, duru, how night, the club big. And I go, yeah, I know, but... And I always tell my mom, Mom, I got a study group. <laughs> and she's like, I've seen a class in study group at 10 o'clock at night. So, you know, we, once we, I cleared that and got that out of my system, um, you know, everything was good. My mom was my, my backbone. And, you know, I, I really, I really truly loved her for that, for that support. I didn't really know a lot of gay people uh, when I came out to my mom in the late 90s, early 2000s. And again, I have to give um, one of my friends uh, credit uh, Tim De La Cruz, uh, he's also another uh, prominent person in our LGBTQ community and I did meet um, more gay people through Tim and his, his, his partner from before and they had introduced me to, uh, Tim had introduced me to Charlene Cruz and Ed um, Bubbles, known as Bubbles Roberto, uh, Charlene known as Mama Char in our group and Ed as Bubbles and that, that's what led to our group which I am a part of, the house, the Sisters of the Moonlight. And um, the Charlene and Bubbles, ex, you know, they're like the mother and father of our house. And they really accepted me. It just felt um, right. You know, most of us have our biological family, but, you know, in our community, we have our chosen family. And so that's who, um, you know, my chosen family is, the, the Sisters of the Moonlight. I think I became more aware of it when people started sharing their stories with me. They went through because I fortunately didn't have that type of experience growing up like I always was surrounded by people that didn't care you know who I chose to love as long as I was loving somebody that's all I cared about I think that was when you know even our house the house of Diosa including the sisters of the moon yeah. like we started to really really reach out there to the community like people 
started coming to us asking us questions like how do I do this, how do I do that, oh you know I think one of my children is you know identifying as gay or trans, yes. like I don't know what to do. What do we what do? We do? Um, what, what are your thoughts, you know, how can we guide our, our children or you know someone that's coming to us and confiding in us. It wasn't until recently I, I just got to know Josh as well, yeah. so it's, it's, it's different and hearing Joshua's perspective you know he grew up in a in a time where it was socially acceptable now versus my time you know back in the 80s 90s when i was going to school i would get beat up or bullied you know yeah. you get teased you know you're i mean i'm an educator now and i see it in the schools it's so socially accepting now and i'm just like wow you know we've we've come so far we have come a long way yeah we really yeah have. you know if you tie that into chamar culture it's families you know, it's yeah. all about respect for one another and for me I just think it's a lot more socially accepting to be who we are here on Guam only because there's been a lot of overwhelming support gay straight by trans straight it doesn't so that was profiles in pride and make sure to check out the Hoffa Day Zoo podcast premiering soon next week right here on the KUM Podcast Network. Good stuff. So thanks to Josh and Glenn for their wonderful participation. We are going live again. We are all over the island today, everybody. And we are taking you up to breezy Laddie Heights, where Chris Barnett is at Atacal Elementary School, where he has the honor of reading to some kids in the summer school program. So Chris, what have you got? Who have you got? And what book are you going to undertake today? Uh, hey, thanks, Jay. I'll give you more on my book later. Uh, but you know, I'm not the only one who's doing our reading here at Attica Elementary Summer School. It was funny, we walked into the uh, lounge and we saw the vice speaker, the public auditor, the chief uh, justice of the district court. Uh, they all got nervous when I walked in, by the way. But yeah, so they pulled out all the stops. So Senator Chris Duaneus, Senator Joanne Brown, also Mary Okada, a GCC president, and the uh, vice chair of the Board of Education, all here. Uh, and all of them saying that this is their first face-to-face -face book reading for the kids uh, since the pandemic. Mine too, and that's why um, it was funny because uh, Miss Tilly actually invited me down and um, I thought that it was just face-to-face -face straight up, but then I found out they could zoom in, but I wanted to just come here because we got a bunch of kids here and it's just been so long since I've been to a school to you know, really do anything. And so we got our, our buddy, uh, Sean here, Sean Alec, and we have also Jocko, what's your last name? Cruz. Jocko Cruz. <laughs> And uh, they are proud students here at Attica Elementary, home of the Helita. That's right, the Helita. So, you guys want to do a shout out? We'll go ahead and put you on the link and you do a shout out. Shout out to all the senators in Guam. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shout out at the same time. Morning. There you go. Sean, go ahead. Shout out to my mom and dad and all the parents. There you go. So that's uh, good, man. Shout out to the senators, uh, the parents. So we're actually going to go to uh, Miss Eileen Menno's class. I wonder I'm going to read to Sean. What grade is uh, Miss Menno's class? Fourth grade. So, what are you guys learning about in fourth grade right now? Um, we're learning about math, reading, science, and writing. Writing. So, what's your favorite subject? Writing. Writing. What do you like to write about? Uh, story books. Oh, really? What kind of stories? I know uh, imaginary things. Oh, that's good. Hi. My favorite kind. Hi, are you Ms. Good morning, yeah. Yes, Mrs. Menno here. Thank you Hi. for inviting us. Thanks for coming. Sean was just telling me what you guys are learning about. Uh, he likes writing very much. So let's go ahead and meet. Uh, yeah. Good morning, Guam. Right on. What's up, Annika? Here, my online kids. Oh, hi, online kids. Good morning. <laughs> there you go. Thank you for joining us. So, Mrs. Menno, this yeah. is like hybrid? <laughs> Pretty much. Right. So, some students do yeah. online yes. and some do face-to-face, -face, yes. right? Yes. So, I do, uh, even last year, we started last year, actually, where I had five online kids wow. together with my uh, seven students that are face-to-face. So, yeah. I just got to ask you, I know I'm here to read a book, but just as a teacher, uh, how's it been during this uh, pandemic to, to do things like online teaching? It was, it was hard at first, but then once you get used to it, because we started uh, in August, so it was really, it was easy. It was pretty easy for me, right. and it was nice too. And the I think the difficulty there is being the, the internet being on and off. Right. That's the only right. part and so I know that uh, GDOE had a bunch of the MyFives. Yes, those were helpful. Nice. Very helpful. All right, so let's say hi to our, our online students. Hi, good morning. 
these guys are lucky because they're just two steps away from the kitchen, <laughs> right? Yes, yes. All right, so we're going to read a book for you guys uh, today and our students in class. So you're able to see. There too. So uh, oh, we nice. just got our projector last uh, school year. Wow. So, so Annika got all the goodies. Look yes. at that. Yes. So there's the speaker. Right, go ahead and sit down, Mr. Chris. Are you coming to sit down? Yes, if you want. Maybe I'll stand. Okay. Is that okay? okay. Uh, let me just well, let's go around and introduce ourselves first. Just for uh, right now, we're streaming live on the link, KUAM News uh, Morning Show, the link. Uh, and so if you guys just want to go through and introduce yourselves, we'll get right into this. So we'll go ahead and, uh, first of all, who's happy to be here today? <laughs> there you go. Raise your hand. Let me see your fafa. <laughs> Put your hand on your fafa stings. <laughs> all right. So you guys want to introduce yourselves? Yeah, we'll go start. I'm Liza. I do not mean you. I'm Liza. Whoa, for what? Um, it was in Oh, nice. And how was that? It was, yeah, it was exciting. Right. So how's it feel to be on the news again? It's amazing. It is, right? Hey, what's up, man? This guy's a KUA News veteran right here, right on. Hi, my name is Kiana. It's great. Do you want to do a shout out to your family or anybody watching today? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I didn't prepare for this. <laughs> We know Sean already. What's your name, boy? No. Well, you got a shout out you want to do? No. Uh, so you're here in summer school. Attica, what's your favorite thing about going to summer school? Playground. Playground. And that's something that we didn't really have last year because of the COVID, right? Yeah. Right. So you're just happy to be here today and you're looking forward to recess. Yes. Nice. Okay, let's go over here. What's your name, Nanny? My name is Samantha Lee Valencia. And the reason why I like to come here is because my Nino works here, Mr. D. Oh, your so your Nino works here. Oh, that's right. So you always get extra for lunch, right? <laughs> come on, Nino, you got to step it up. <laughs> okay, let's go here. What's your name, Nan? Huh? Tenorio. Tenorio? Oh, Parentis, I'm your uncle. That's it. There you go. <laughs> yeah, right on. What do you like about Attica, home of the elite type? Your teacher, right? Yeah. There you go. What are you learning about? What's your favorite subject to learn about? Reading. Reading. That's good. Well, we're going to do some reading today. How about you? Huh? Nicole Valentine. Nicole Valentine, right? This guy's very popular in February, no? What's your favorite thing about a school? Oh, you even drew a heart. That's nice. Nice. Mm -hmm. Learning. Learning, that's my favorite thing. That should be your favorite thing in, in school. Um, what's it like to come to class and uh, uh, sit in a classroom full of students? Because we didn't get really get to do that last year, right? You like it? Do you like these kids here or what? Yeah. Because they're all right? They're pretty okay? Okay, all right, all right, okay. Oh, you're online last school year. So that's good for you, man. Good for you. Way to go. A lot of these kids, their first time to be face to face. I know. My, this is my first time to come to face to face class since wow. before the pandemic. Wow. How about you guys? You want to introduce yourselves? Go ahead, Ethan. Hi, I'm Ethan. Hi, Ethan. Hi, Ethan. Hi, Ethan. Hi, Ethan. Hi, Ethan. What do you like most about uh, summer classes at Attica? I like to do too much. Like it makes me feel. That's good. How about we have Sharonia? Good morning. <laughs> Go ahead and introduce yourself, then. Go ahead, Sharonia. Turn on your mic. Hi, my name is Sharonia. Sharonia, what do you like about summer school, girl? <laughs> There you go. Good morning. That's a good thing to like. All right, let's go ahead and get into this uh, book, guys. I'm going to read you this book. Uh, it's actually a book I read with my kids a lot. And I don't know the grade level of it, but it's a pretty cool story. It's called Zen Shorts. And it has, uh, what is that? Panda. Panda bear, right? Do we have these on Guam? You sure? I think we have it up in the mountains of Jigo because it's colder up there. 
Florida, you might see pandas in Florida, maybe, right? You definitely yeah, can so see. Right. And pandas are in Japan. That's right. You can also find pandas at the food court. <laughs> right? You guys seen yeah. the pandas? Yeah, panda you've been to Japan. I've never been to Japan. I want to go. There. Last Narita. Wow, you've been to Narita. All right, maybe I shouldn't read this book. We just talked to these kids for an hour. It's way more interesting. Yes. Right. See, she's like, yeah, yeah, no, nah, your book looks boring. <laughs> it is a great story. This, uh, this is really a great book. I really it like it a lot. The reason why you're saying that because the lady before read it. I have read this book a bunch of times. Boy, well, kids say the darndest things, don't they? Okay, here we go, Mrs. Meadow and Atikal. Elementary home of the elite. I'm going to read you Zen Shorts by John J. Moon. Michael, Michael, there's a bear outside, <laughs> said Carl. A what? asked Michael. A bear! He's like really big and he's like totally in the backyard. Well, what's he doing? asked Michael. He's just sitting there. He has an umbrella. An umbrella? You see, Michael went to go look out the window. <laughs> yeah, and the, the brother is pointing out the door. Yeah. Would you guys go run and look out the window if someone told you there was a bear in the backyard? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, like freak out. <laughs> Oh, boy. By the time the boys got outside, their sister, Addie, was already talking with them. I'm sorry for arriving unannounced, said the bear. The wind carried my umbrella all the way from my backyard to your backyard. I thought I would retrieve it before it became a nuisance. He spoke with a slight panda accent. Michael introduced himself. Then Addie introduced Carl because Carl was shy around bears that he didn't know. And this is how Addie, Michael, and Carl met Stillwater. So the name of the bear is? Stillwater. Stillwater. The next day, Addie went to have tea with Stillwater. What kind of tea do you think they had? King Carl? Yeah. Or black tea? Black tea. Or that tea. tea. Milk tea. Milk tea. Oh, they had milk tea. Boba? Right, okay, so they had a lot of different teeth. Hello. Addie said as she stepped inside. Come in, come in, far away voice called. Then she heard the voice say, oh, oh, yes, come out, come out. Stillwater was in the backyard. You cannot come into the backyard. He was in a tent. This is a birthday present from my Uncle Rye. He always gives presents on his birthday to celebrate the day he was born. I like it so much that I'm not staying in my house right now. Stillwater invited Addie to sit with him. You brought some cake. That was very nice of you. Is it your birthday? No, <laughs> said Addie. It's not mine either, said Stillwater. But let me give you a gift for my uncle's birthday. I will tell you a story. The name of this story is called Uncle Ryan the Moon. My Uncle Rye lived alone in a small house up in the hills. He didn't own many things. He lived a very simple life. One evening, he discovered he had a visitor. A robber had broken into the house and was going through my uncle's few belongings. The robber didn't notice Uncle Rye, and when my uncle said, hello, the robber was so startled, he almost fell down. My uncle smiled at the robber and shook his head. Welcome, welcome. Oh, so nice of you to visit my house. Hello. <laughs> the robber opened his mouth to speak, but he couldn't think of anything to say. Because Rye never lets anyone leave empty-handed, he looked around the tiny hut for a gift for the robber, but there was nothing to give. The robber began to back towards the door. Oh, man, this guy's going to call GPD. He wanted to leave. At last, Uncle Ryan knew what to do. He took off his only robe, which was old and tattered, and he said, here, Tello, take this. <laughs> the robber thought my uncle was crazy. He took the robe, dashed out the door, and escaped into the night. My uncle sat and looked at the moon, silvery light spilling over the mountains, making all things quietly beautiful. 
Poor man, lamented my uncle. All I had to give him was my tattered robe. If only I could have given him this wonderful moon. Aww. Your uncle sounds so nice, said Abby. I want him to be my Nino. I don't think I could give away my only robe. I know how that is, but there's always the moon. That was a good story, said Abby. Thank you, and this is good cake. Ooh, who likes cake? What kind of cake do you like? Oh, you got good taste in cake, bro. <laughs> how about you, Sean? What kind of cake do you like? You don't like cake? What? Oh, my goodness. Sharonia, what kind of cake do you like, Sharonia? I like ice cake. Tea. The next day, Michael went to see Stillwater. Here I am, Stillwater called from the tree. Oh, his name is Picking Mango. <laughs> Can I come up, says Stillwater? If you're careful. What if we could fly, man? Wouldn't that be so cool, said Michael. Oh, dang, so Michael. We could cast shadows on the clouds, said Stillwater. But what if we fell? <laughs> If we fell, we might break something, Stillwater said. That would be bad. Maybe, said Stillwater. Maybe, said Michael. I think it's time for another story. The farmer's luck. There was once an old farmer who had worked his crops for many years. One day, his horse ran away. Upon hearing the news, his neighbors came to visit. Oh, man, such bad luck that your horse ran away. <laughs> oh, man, oh, sucks to be you. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's bad luck, the farmer said. The next morning, the horse returned, bringing with it two other wild horses. Oh, such good luck, dude, the neighbor said. <laughs> maybe, said the farmer. The following day, his son tried to ride one of the untamed horses, was thrown off and broke his leg. Hi, a day. <laughs> Bad luck, they said. Maybe, answered the farmer. The day after that, the military officials came to the village to draft young men into the army to fight into the war. Seeing that the farmer's son's leg was broken, they did not take him to go fight in the war. Whoa, such good luck, but man, he can't go on the base. <laughs> Maybe, said the farmer. I get it, said Michael. Maybe good luck and bad luck is they're like all mixed up. You never know what will happen next. Yes, you never know, said Stillwater. So who's the last one to go see Stillwater? The shy boy, huh? Carl, right? Is the shy one? Yeah. You know what my grandma used to say? If you're shy, you don't try. So don't be shy. The day after that, Carl went to visit Stillwater. Oh, man, Michael said he couldn't bring over stuff to go swimming, and I'm mad at Michael. He's always telling you what to do. Uh, so I brought everything. <laughs> oh, my. It's a little pool. I don't know if all those things will fit. Well, let's see, Carl said. Indeed, let's see, said Stillwater. Stillwater looked at the pool. I a day. Look at that. The things can go swimming, but we can't, Stillwater said. I just brought too much stuff, said Carl. That's okay. I'll help you carry it home later, said Stillwater. Now it's time for another story coming up. Why does Michael always have to tell me what to do, Carl said. If he were here, I bet he'd climb really high, and I'd jump on him like this, and then I'd do a big smash like that. That look fun? Yeah. It looks fun to stand on a stomach, right? A big stomach? It's like a big balloon. Oh. Later, Carl and Stillwater had tea. They had milk tea and king car and black tea and nest tea and green tea because it's health tea. I thought you said boba. Oh, and boba tea. Oh, you're right. Oh, sorry. I forgot your tea. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Sean, what kind of tea? You like tea? You like boba too? Okay. Yeah, boba. Later, Carl and Stillwater had tea. Carl, you spent the whole day being angry with Michael. 
Did you notice how much fun we had? Carl watched the steam from his cup. I'm sorry, I brought all this stuff, he said. You don't need to be sorry, said Stillwater. Right now, you need to carry. Hold on tight, and I will tell you a story. This story is called A Heavy Load. Two traveling monks, who knows what a monk is? Wise guy. The wise guy, it's also like a priest, right? Kind of like a priest. Yeah, these are mouse monks. It looks like ratatouille. It does kind of look like ratatouille, right? Two traveling monks, ratatouille is a Disney movie about a rat that learns how to cook in the kitchen. There's actually a dish called ratatouille. And that's why it's named Ratatouille because rat tatouille. You watch it. It's a rat who makes yeah, it's a rat who makes ratatouille. He puts the rat in ratatouille. <laughs> okay, here we go. Two traveling monks reached the town where there was a young woman waiting to step out of her sedan chair. The rains had made deep puddles and she couldn't step across without spoiling her silken zori. She had a very fancy zori. Wow. She stood there looking very cross and impatient. Oh my God, it's like, anyone gonna help me just cross this river right now? Like I have this very nice dory and I just don't wanna get them wet. So like, is anybody just gonna help me or what? She was scolding her attendants. They had nowhere to place all of her packages they held for her. So they couldn't help her across the puddle. The younger monk noticed the woman said nothing and walked by. But the older monk quickly picked her up and hooky backed her across the water. See that? What a nice monk, huh? He put her down on the other side. She didn't even say thank you. Oh, she no. just shoved him out of the way and left. Oh, As they continued on their way, the young monk looked very sad and upset. After several hours, unable to hold his silence, he spoke out. Man, Polly, oh, that woman back there, she was so selfish and so rude. But you picked her up anyway, and you carried her across the river, and you know what? She didn't even say thank you. Oh, man, you made me so mad. Oh. She didn't even say thank you, guys. Can you believe that? What's the number one rule? Right. Oh. <laughs> Finally, the old monk spoke. I set the woman down hours ago, young man. Why are you still carrying her? Oh, that's deep. Do you think you have carried it long enough, asked Stillwater? Yes, yeah, said Carl. Good, said Stillwater. And this is how Addie, Michael, Carl, and Stillwater became friends. The end. All right, how was that? How was that, Stroni, all right? Ethan, you guys like that? Right on, that's good. Nice, what are you eating? Cereal, you got a little milk on your chin. Okay, there you go, right on, okay, okay. Hey, did you get, did you offer your classmates? They don't want cereal. <laughs> guys, thank you so much for letting me come uh, read to you. I hope you guys got some lessons from this book. What were some of the things that we learned from reading this book? That the uh, three monks said thank you when the old monk came for all the way to the other side. Right, and then the young monk was so mad about it. Yes, because the three didn't say thank you to the old monks who. Actually, the right. So he was so mad that she didn't say thank you that he didn't even get to have fun on the walk because all he kept thinking about was how mad the lady was, right? Right. Anyone else want to tell me what we might have learned? You forgot. You forgot. That's okay. We're going to eat cake. Thank you, guys. Hey, Link fan, thank you for coming along. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, Okay. On behalf of our class, go ahead, Freddie. All right, this is where they're going to give me the big check. Malfunction. 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 Malfun
Thank you very much. Right on. Oh, what's this, guys? We got some homemade cards. Look at that. Oh, that's yours? Yeah, day. Wow, you're a good color. Oh, dear Chris Barnett, thank you for meeting us face to face. Thank you for reading us a book. Love, Samantha Lee Valencia. Thank you, Samantha. Oh, look at this. We got KUAM, 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 KUAM. You get it? There's a theme here. KUAM. Viva KUAM. Can we have the picture? Yes, we can. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's me. That's good. Good shot. Yeah, that's good. I like that angle. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, our Link fan, for zooming in with us here at Akal Elementary, home of the Elite Time. Mrs. Benno, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and read you guys face to face. All right, we're out. We're going to take some pictures here. Thank you, Link fan. Back to you, Jason. Thank you, guys. All right, Chris Barnett doing work. You know what, guys? Envy is a sin, but I'm really, really jealous, Vic. I know. It's, it's By the been way, a Victor while. Victoria's working the board today <laughs> since, since Chris is out. It's good to see you, man. In a minute, guys. It's Honestly, it's really nice to go, to be back, uh, to work with you guys. It's always an, a, an opportunity to come down and just share the, 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 the time with you guys and just help in any way possible. Really. But as much fun as this is, that looks so much cooler. Yeah. That I was mean, fun. Oh, man. I miss, I miss these and career days and, and stuff like that where we're just out there with the kids and just showcasing you know what we do and kind of hopefully uh um you know encourage them and and um you know in, in one day they might do what we do and to carry on this this occupation pretty yeah, much of what we do yeah we, we can't wait for career days we we love those kind of things we even love and hey everybody we are really taking steps as we have for the last ever since march let me say um to make sure that we have a safe and sanitary and uh and wonderful environment uh, workspace here at work and everything like that. But when we can allow people back in and everything, one of the great joys that we have is student tours. Oh, and yes. they can see what they do. They oh, sit yeah. in on shows. They come in and do the radio show with you. And Oh, yeah, I miss those. So those when days when are... it's safe to do that again, we are going to welcome kids back because that's a lot of fun. Oh, I'm definitely going to be here at 8 o'clock in the morning for that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll tell you what. It is about 9.35, everybody. We're going to take a quick commercial break, pay a couple bills, say thank you to our sponsors, and then when we come back, Kind of fitting because over uh, in Tuon, once again, the economic forum is going on. We're going to show you a bit of Nestor Lacanto's discussion with Mel Mendiola, the uh, administrator and CEO of the Guam Economic Development Authority, as they talked yesterday about the small business pandemic assistance loan. The governor was mentioning this when she gave her remarks. We're going to show you um, how Gita is helping small businesses during this time of recovery. So stay tuned. That's coming up next. The world of television is more exciting than ever. Don't miss a minute of special presentations from NBC on KUAM TV 8 or from CBS on KUAM TV 11. Every month, we'll bring you the fun and excitement of award shows and red carpet moments, special series presentations, and other great network programs. Brought to you locally by King's Restaurant, Ruby Tuesday Guam, Bud Light Seltzer, and Docomo Pacific. Giving you more reasons to tune in and turn on. Fall in love with TV again with the best from KUAM Communications. Family platter of fried chicken? Check. Tray of red rice? Check. Birthday cake? Check. One case of water? Check. 12 pack of beer? Check. Two cases of Pepsi? Check. When you have a long checklist but are short on time, we got you. Get it delivered by us. Order on the app or website at uno-go.com. Guam on demand. Shoot, I forgot the paper product. Oh wait, UnoGo has that too. KUAM's multi-platform morning show, The Link, just got a little more delicious with Feed Me Fridays. Chris, Sabrina, Jason, and the rest of the morning crew will take some time each Friday to talk food, taste food, and bring you all the latest and greatest in food from King's Restaurants and Ruby Tuesday Guam. Old faves, new hits, and everything on the menu in between. It's Feed Me Fridays on The Link. Do you feel like you're missing out on something? Make life more rewarding with Pacific Points. Earn and redeem points for bill rebates and free load at IT&E, discounts on fuel at Shell, vouchers at Foodies, and United Mileage Plus Miles. You can even pay with Pacific Points at IT&E, Shell, and Foodies. Pacific Points. Do more. Get more. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648 7867 for more information.
action is a human necessity, one we need today more than ever. And with the new First Hawaiian Bank mobile app, you can stay just as connected to your finances. And it all starts with yes. I decided to get vaccinated because I knew that it was the only way to keep myself, my family, friends, and everyone safe. And it was also my way of contributing to the fight against COVID-19. And I also encourage everyone out there, and especially those in the FSM communities here on Guam, to do your part and get vaccinated. My name is Victorious Flan, and I am a proud member of the vaccination. Join the vaccination. Scan and plan. For more information, go to KUAM.com. Brought to you by American Medical Center, your partner in healthcare. After a year with so many games and events delayed or unplayed, the world is ready for anything and everything in the world of sports. KUAM Communications is ready with more games, more championships, and more specials that are guaranteed to bring out the fan in you. Don't miss a minute of gameplay from NBC on KUAM TV 8 or from CBS on KUAM TV 11. Every month, we'll bring you the action and excitement. Brought to you locally by Michelob Ultra, Superior Light Beer, Mariana's Irrigation and Landscape, and Docomo Pacific. Just more great reasons to tune in and turn on so you'll fall in love with TV again with the best from KUAM Communications. Catch SportsLink on the KUAM News Morning Show, The Link, every Friday to hear about the latest in sports news, game schedules, athlete profiles, and more. SportsLink, brought to you each week by Cure Alkaline Water and Mariana's Irrigation and Landscape, airs every Friday across the multimedia platforms of KUAM. Tune into the broadcast on Breeze 93.9 FM on KUAM TV 11, live stream through the KUAM News Facebook page, or view highlights on YouTube, KUAM News Facebook, and Instagram. SportsLink is hosted by Dave Delgado through KUAM Sports, and he will make sure that everyone knows what is happening on the fields, in the gyms, and everywhere in between. The relationship between Guam and Manila, Philippines is undeniable as we share similar cultural traditions, history, and heritage with generations of Filipinos calling Guam home. KUAM presents a monthly look at the capital city featuring in-depth and engaging interviews on everything from medical tourism to new business and government leaders. Veteran newscaster Nestor Lecanto delivers Beyond Our Borders. This special program is brought to you by the Bank of Guam and KFC. KUAM Communications continues our perpetuation of our Samoro culture, language, and heritage with features available to our listening and viewing audience including streaming of Samoro music 24 hours per day on Isla Digital Radio on KUAM.com and the KUAM News app. Samoro News Update, weekdays on the link and the KUAM News YouTube channel. Conversations about life in our Samoro language podcast with Tosta Paku with Kin Conception. Seasonal specials, shows and other features highlighting the beauty of our language, culture, and history. It's a new era of our continued commitment to our tomorrow heritage. Isla, watch, listen, stream. Viva Isla! As a reporter, I often ask people what compelled them to get the COVID-19 vaccine. For me, someone who's lived through coronavirus, I can't help but fear the idea of possibly infecting others, unknowingly passing it along to someone with a lesser immune system, someone's mother, father, grandparent, or someone who wouldn't be as blessed to suffer only minor symptoms. When I contracted COVID, that is what weighed most on my heart and mind, and that's why I did everything in my power to prevent this from happening, by following public health protocols. And now I am doing the same thing, being mindful my decisions, choices, and actions don't only affect me, but the entire nation. So I chose to get vaccinated, simply to protect others. My name is Adriana Cotero. I'm a KUAM news reporter and anchor, and a proud member of the vaccination. Join the vaccination. Scan and plan. For more information, go to KUAM.com. Brought to you by American Medical Center, your partner in healthcare. All right, welcome back to The Link, everybody, on this Thursday morning. Goodwill and good information seem to be the themes of the day. The information, of course, coming from Tumon Bay, where the economic forum is ongoing until 12 in the afternoon. you still got time if you want to join the Zoom webinar. You have to register, though. It's completely free. Just uh, check out ghra.org, and you can jump in. Or if you just want to watch, join the comments. It's streaming right now on GHRA's uh, page on Facebook. Before we get to our next segment with Mel Mendiola and Nestor Lacanto talking about Small business disaster recovery. Guys, I got Joe, sir, and I got my guy Vic over here. 
Guys, it's a great day outside, wonderful weather. It would be optimal for your mental health, for your physical health, just to go outside, have a nice long stretch. But I want to say do not yawn because there are these gnats that are oh, flying yeah. all over the place. And they <laughs> are, like, I'm going to use a word that we used to use in the 80s. I realize I may be, like, a little bit older than you, Vic, but we used to, like, ew, grody. <laughs> Yeah, we used I, don't to say know, that. I don't even. Dude, these gnats are Ew, all yeah, I don't over know the, the other place. One. <laughs> Did you experience them yesterday? Uh, yeah, outside. I went, was walking up, took a pot race to grab a drink, and I was just, I ran into a whole group of them. I'm like, what? And, and then halfway through, I would watch everybody on Instagram just, you know, uh, do stories about them. I'm like, oh, I guess it's a whole and other thing. And they swarm now. together. So if you run into one, you're going to run into like a thousand. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it is a serious note, everybody, because remember, there was that one. Um, Laboratory confirmed case of dengue fever, which is, of course, is a mosquito-borne illness. Uh, typically, uh, it happens when uh, infected mosquitoes go around like standing water. So, of course, public health is reminding you if you have buckets, if you have potted plants or, you know, just um, uh, waste receptacles or maybe even open tires, you want to go out and empty out those, maybe even rinse them out and then let them dry just so mosquitoes um, aren't doing that. We do know the public health has identified uh, certain high-risk areas and it will be going around applying pesticides so um, those areas can be um, very well taken care of but one confirmed laboratory uh, case of dengue fever we haven't had that in uh, right at the September of 2019 was the last time there was an outbreak uh, if you're wondering what the metric is for an outbreak it's if three or more cases happen within a two-week period so there was that one case so please be safe and everything but yeah those gnats really really gross and I've got outside my house up in Jigo I've got these two big like plumeria plants Oh, guys man. and the nets love those things too so as soon as i walked out of the car i was like i mean you can just see them they look like you know like like a funnel like a twister or something like that i was like oh man and and you were saying Vic, because you you saw that um people yeah people were talking people about were mowing their lawns because you know like th there was a there was a mm -hmm. storm warning the other day but it was just a little bit of rain people took the opportunity to bush cut to mow their lawns and that's when those things come out too i guess yeah i mean it's crazy it's, uh, to actually see it. I thought it was just us here in Harmon uh, the other day when I was walking up to Compadres, but after seeing uh, stories on it on Instagram, I was like, wow, I guess it's a whole, um, a whole island thing yeah. now. You know crazy. where you can find it a, a lot is uh, right up the street from us here at the, uh, the Dedido Gym, the, heart, oh, the wow. that fitness trail. If you go around the backside, you know, like if, if you're walking um, counterclockwise, you mm -hmm. walk past the gym and then take left turns. When you walk, you're getting the the jungle on one side to the backside. It's not so bad there, but if you're wearing like a mask, you'll see them. I mean, it's all over your masks, and when you sweat, they literally like get underneath your eyelids, up your nose, in your ears, and I mean, they, you know, they they they're they're fearless and they're stupid. So they land in your ear and then they <laughs> die. Right? Fearless and they're stupid. Yeah, the <laughs> same thing has been said about me on a couple of occasions. Um, but then when you come around the back and you're walking um, southward when you're mm -hmm. like street side. For some reason, you know, there's there's that uh, there's the plants and the ivy that grow on like that fence there, like right. when you're right mm -hmm. next to the pool. They're all over that side, dude. Oh man. I mean, they just come out and again. I mean, you know, like you've seen you've seen in like Tom and Jerry cartoons, they go in there, they form like a hammer, and then they're chasing you, or you know, they, <laughs> they form like the stop sign, or so. I mean, it literally looks like that. So if you if you're walking over there, and you know, a lot of people are getting outside and working out, you want to wear your mask anyway, everybody, because we got to mm -hmm. take care of each other. But you know. Maybe get like a bandana, you know, right. uh, maybe wear some shades so they don't get uh, in your face eyes. Face shield, whatever. The face shield <laughs> yeah. will be great. Face oh. shield will be absolutely great. But yeah, uh, maybe l definitely long sleeve, uh, long sleeve shirt. And please, everybody, do what do what you can to take care of, um, make sure that dengue fever does not spread uh, in our island community because that, that, that can be very, very dangerous. But oh, yeah, yeah. Th those gnats are nasty. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I had to run away from the group that I ran into here a uh, lot days ago so <laughs> i was I, I didn't expect them and i just like oh my god and, and then they just it's just crazy that they just stay in one place and then they gather together and they, and they you know create a whole uh, big group so yeah. uh, just keep an eye out i guess all right yeah. well tell you what as promised and in much more uh, positive and inspiring and uplifting news uh, we do have a excerpt from nestor canto's in full zooms series where he actually brought you mel mendiola the administrator of gita and they talk about small business disaster recovery and what the agency can do for your business in full zoom is presented to you by calvo enterprises inc 
Half a day, everyone, and welcome to another edition of In Full Zoom. I'm Nestor Leconto, and I'm pleased to welcome as our guest this week, the CEO and Administrator of the Guam Economic Development Authority, Ms. Melanie Mendiola. Thanks for joining us, Mel. Thank you. Half a day, Nestor. How are you? Good. Half a day. Thanks, thanks for joining us. And uh, we're here to talk about the Guam Small Business Pandemic Assistance Grant Program. Can you just give us an overview of what exactly that is? Sure, sure. So as you as you can recall, in 2020, when we were in the, the very first, the beginnings of the pandemic, um, the Office of the Governor responded by doing um, what we called the Small Business Pandemic Assistance Grant 2020. And, you know, Agita, we're so creative. We don't give anything. We, they asked us what we were going to call the grant. We said, we're calling it the Small Business Pandemic Assistance Grant. <laughs> and so, um, so we were able to get some aid out there to the businesses over the summer. And um, we, we got really good, we got good feedback, but we learned, we also learned a lot of great lessons from uh, run rolling that, unveiling that grant program. Um, later on in the year, the governor uh, continued to see, especially after the second lockdown, our governor continued to see the um, ongoing difficulty of our local businesses. And um, so she hadn't initially planned to do it, but she kind of piecemealed funding from other uh, parts of the CARES Act. And she put together a rental assistance grant program for um, primarily for our brick and mortar businesses, bars, restaurants, um, retail. And uh, following that, um, we were we were kind of short on that one. We didn't have, uh, we had projected that we need about 5 million, but at the time only 3 million in, in funding was available. And so we continued uh, to work together with the Office of the Governor to try to find the additional 2 million. But then at, then at the same time, the governor uh, continues to recognize that small businesses create Across America, small businesses create the largest number of uh, local jobs. Here in Guam, our small businesses have to be especially resilient. Not only do they deal with um, an economy that's very fragile, right? We also deal with the changes in tourism, so global changes. Uh, we deal with uh, weather, right? <laughs> Typhoons and things like that. Um, competition from abroad in the form of online businesses. And so the governor continues to see that small businesses need assistance. And so uh, she asked us to put together another program uh, for to do two things. Number one is to meet the needs of those businesses that we didn't have enough funding for last year. So under the rental assistance grant to figure out a way to close that gap, number one. And number two, to unroll another small business pandemic grant. Um, and our goal was to unroll, uh, to, was to unveil a small business grant uh, that is um, more, I don't, um, maybe uh, more effective and more responsive and even better than the one that we did last year. And so, uh, because the governor would like to wait until the final guidance is 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 passed or wait, wait until she reviews, wait, wait until they review the final guidance. Uh, what we wanted to do was we wanted to give um, small businesses a chance to start to get all their paperwork together. We know regardless of what the rules say, we know she really wants to do, we know she wants to do something. That's the first thing. The second thing is we know that small businesses are gonna have to put in paperwork. And generally the paperwork is an updated business license, updated GRTs, um, and so we wanted to give everyone a chance to start to get the paperwork together so that when we pull the trigger on the application, that businesses are ready to go. They can fill out the application, turn it in and get processed as soon as possible and as quickly as possible. Yeah. And how much uh, money will be available for this? So we did request from the office of the governor, we requested $30 million for the American Rescue Plan. It is um, uh, so far, um, the, the signs are good that the governor does want to set aside $30 million to go out to small businesses. However, it is it is not clear yet whether the 30 million will be inclusive of the 2 million for to make up for the businesses who didn't get the rent relief last year, or if that'll be separate. Um, we're also working on a program for farmers, um, and farmers aren't don't don't um, farmers don't do BPTs. They don't do GRTs, and uh, but there aren't that many. There aren't quite as many farmers, so we don't anticipate that being a large portion of the 30 million. Although there would be a portion of the 30 million, just to give you refresh your memory. Uh, last year, we uh, distributed about 18 million in the form of a small business pandemic grant to over 2,200 businesses. And so this is a more generous program, uh, especially for our smaller businesses. So if you're a larger, if you're a larger small business, so the, the cap on the last round was $50,000. Um, if if um, this one, the cap will continue to be 50,000. So if you hit the cap last round, you'll probably stay at the cap this round, so 50,000. But if you're a smaller business who maybe the last round you qualified for $3,000, then this round you'll probably get a more generous award, closer to $6,000. Yeah. 
Yeah. So just to be clear, this is a grant program. This is not a payback, right? This is not a loan? That's correct. It is a grant program unless, okay, so federal monies, you cannot double dip with federal monies, meaning you cannot cover the same things with our grant as you would with PPP, EIDL, restaurant relief, or any other federal type of program. If you do that, you will be required to pay somebody back, whether it's uh, GITA, the, whether it's this, the CARES Act, I mean, I'm sorry, the American Rescue Plan monies, or your PPP or EIDL. So you really only, you have to uh, be careful about what you're, um, what, you're, uh, what you're assigning to what a program that you're going after. Yeah, and are there any restrictions on how they can use the uh, grant uh, funding? In its current uh, design uh, that we're looking to unroll or unveil, um, in its current design, a portion of the grant will be pledged to your landlords and any back rents. So if you have, um, if you have uh, rental arrears this year, then that is something um, that you will need to address with a portion of your award. Um, and, uh, and then with the rest, you can use for other qualified um, business expenses. And when I say qualified business expenses, again, it's really more of the double dipping. You don't wanna cover the same things that you cover with PPP that you do with uh, a small business pandemic grant um, coming out of basically uh, uh, the same federal pot of money. In full Zoom, we'll continue in just a moment. In full Zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. In Full Zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. Yeah, what are you hearing from? All right, that is in full Zoom. A snippet, a smidgen. Uh, Nestor and Mel covered a lot of other topics, a lot of really good stuff. So if you are a small business, you want to make sure and apprise yourself of that information. Good stuff. And uh, congratulations to Mel once again. Um, before we head out, we got about five more minutes and everything like that. Since we have Mr. Victorious here and everything, the, ho the host of the immensely popular <laughs> One Micronesia podcast. I mean, this, I mean, you know, we're, we're not just being... Um, melodramatic and everything like that you have really cultivated this show into something that that people throughout micronesia really look forward to i mean it's appointment viewing people really really enjoy what, what's some of the feedback that you're getting man a lot um you know even uh, i think the best one was uh came out from the uh the, the office of the president of the federal state of micronesia uh his uh, the spokesperson told me uh, off the camera and he's like man you know the president loves your podcast he watches wow. your podcast a lot. He's a big fan of what you're doing out there in Guam, and uh, you know. And I and I asked him like, hey, is, was is there you know a possibility of getting you know an exclusive one Micronesia with the FSM president? And he's like, he is. Uh, he says it's all thumbs up. I just got a you know a set of, a, a good timing, and, and you know mm -hmm. things are busy now with with them with the repatriation flights and stuff sure. like that. But I'll definitely. Uh, he says yes. He it's a thumbs up, and uh, hopefully. Uh, I'll try to get him uh, either you know after the summer or you know right before we get into August. So I'm, I'm excited for that podcast as well. Nice. But you know, other than that, like if I meet people out there and you know, everybody's just like you know, uh, it's just a great thing to see um, uh, the highlight, uh, mm. the spotlight just turned uh, taken away from you know all the bad things that that, that you know that was uh, you know Micronesia six years ago, mm -hmm. and now it's uh, it's being shone on this uh, the, the many things that uh, each individual uh, here. Uh, here, either here in Guam, in Hawaii, or in the states, uh, Mike and usually doing amazing things. So I, everybody's just loving it. So and okay. they know it's about it's about each and every one of us as residents mm -hmm. of this part of the world. But uh, for people that live in Micronesia or have roots to Micronesia, they really also they're, they're like, man, you have actually allowed us to like it's it's a show it's a show that we have like it's it's our show, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember you specifically were asking me because the way we do things here at KUM Digital is when we have like a video ready. We'll put it out over all of our platforms as quickly right. as possible because we want you know YouTube to recommend it. We want it to be found in search, and we want all the all the major services to index it. So let's get it out there you know yesterday mm -hmm. so people can find it. But you specifically were asking, and you said the community was saying, can we actually run it live on Facebook on Saturday mornings because right. they want you know like the family to come together and mm -hmm. you know they don't want to be rushed and everything. So what brought that out? Um, I, they uh, they want it because usually you know obviously it, it airs on a Friday mm -hmm. and we just drop everything I have everything ready and we drop it all on a Friday but some people I guess in the states or with the timing and everything they can't even they can't get to watch it so it's always nice to to have it on a separate day to just kind of just let the, the the people just rewatch it if they're rewatching it or or for the first time watching it uh, in which I think we got a lot of viewers then on, especially on the Saturday mm -hmm. it's a weekend here uh, it's kind of like a Friday 
evening back in the states or, or something like that. So I guess it works out that way. So and you can see people in the comments are like, you've mm -hmm. actually built a community because now people are checking in and they're saying, oh hi, how are you? You know, like how was your how was your week? They're asking each other about you know like things that that only they would know. So I mean, it really is like. It's a sense of community to it. It is. It is. I mean, I got to shout out to everybody who uh, tunes in every time, either, you know, watching it on KOM TV 8 or watching it on the Saturday on Facebook Live. It's just, uh, it, it's, it's honestly just, it's been great. And it's because of them, you know, with the, the, the views and the shares. It, it's how we get this information on it so quickly. And Okay, tough question now. And this is almost like asking you, like, who your favorite ch child is, Ooh. right? What's your favorite? Okay. What's your favorite interview that you've done, whether it was like really, really tough or just mm -hmm. a lot of fun and everything like that? And what episode are you most proud of? Episode. Um, I'm going to say my favorite one was with uh, Jojo Area. I think that was the one that kicked it off pretty much. Uh, it was the, um, the, the, the girl who used to attend UOG who had that, that whole, um, I found that whole uh, 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 writing on the wall uh, talking about, you know, the, the Tukis people and the, the skirt they wear and mm -hmm. stuff like that. We aired that at oh, that was like beginning of the pandemic, I think. Uh, I think that was my favorite one because she really broke down and told me her story and, and what she was going through then and how um, how uh, sh uh, at one point was she was kind of embarrassed to 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 embrace who she was as a Chukis woman who would wear you know the the skirt and stuff. So it, it was really uh, it was really a, a great episode because I got to to learn what she had to go through, but then now uh, uh, having to embrace the Chukis culture and just you know just be be proud about it. Nice. That was one of my favorite ones, and I think uh, the greatest one that I did, I guess, is the the big tribute to uh, brother, uh, rest in peace, uh, Edmund Wenger. I, yes. I did, that was one of the, I think, one of the craziest ones that I had to, to work. I, I I spent the whole night here at KUM just to try to put the, the tribute together. So I think that was one of the the two craziest ones that I've um, worked on. Yeah, I think you started on that at like four in the afternoon. Yeah. And then when I came in, like the next morning, like at three, you were still here, and you're, yep. like, you're like, "Bro, I'm almost done." Yeah, uh, it, was, it was crazy. Again, like, putting together, you know, having. It, I think one of the best part about the tribute was uh, the many people that Ed has touched throughout his career, uh, working with Manyetlu and the Mike Green's Resource Center, having them come on the podcast and you know them talking about Ed. It was just I just watched it re, uh, just two days ago. I watched it again in Prod, and I just brought tears in my eyes, and mm. I was like, "Man, I miss Ed." And uh, yeah, we have also some big news. I might have do a podcast at the end of the July. They have a uh, a center. Uh, they worked on a big uh, learning center, and they're naming it after him. That is amazing. So yes. we're gonna be there. I'm I'm gonna get with you later. That to, is righteous. To, 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 to talk about how we can do uh, live coverage with that as well. At Absolutely. I'm end all of the about July. That. So uh, that's I had gonna be I awesome. had the great fortune of interviewing Ed um, a few times and everything oh, yeah. like that. Awesome guy. Uh, oh man. Nice, nice guy. Okay, so that's that's coming up tomorrow. Uh, Vic is gonna have a new episode of the One Micronesia podcast. We also want to tell you today program announcement for you. Make sure to check out our Facebook page because from four to eight, our friends at the Guam Homeless Coalition are going to have a Gua Give Hope Telethon. If you would like to he uh, help the Guam Homeless Coalition in their mission and end homelessness on our island, please, we need to get this done. Everybody on Guam deserves a warm place to stay. You don't have to worry about where you're going to sleep tonight. You're not going to worry if your stuff's going to get stolen. You want a place that you can call your own. On Guam, we, we know what home is, and so everybody should have that. So let's all make sure to tune into the Give Hope Telethon. We're going to share the link. It's going to be a live stream, so from 4 to 8, uh, our friends at the Guam Homeless Coalition have a lot of really, really cool things planned. It's going to be entertaining. It's going to be formative. It's going to be emotional, certainly. And we need your help. So make sure that's a 4 to 8 today. The Give Hope Telethon, we're going to be sharing that with you. For Victorious Falan, Nat, thanks for jumping in today, man. Hey, it was awesome. I mean, it, just two hours, but it was the best two hours ever. I haven't, you know, done this whole crazy run the board and, and, and work with the crew in a while. So. I, it was an amazing one. Thank let's you. Let's not let's not wait for the holidays and do this again, man. Jump, jump in anytime. You know you're I part will. of the crew, man. I will. <laughs> and for DJ Joe, sir, who was working a mile a minute today. Tough show, man. I'm Jason Salas. Thank you, everybody, for watching the link. Have a safe and blessed Thursday. Take care. We'll see you tomorrow morning.